Okay, we have also recording in progress. I, I hope you are all okay with this. Um, I think we're ready we to start. People connecting. Yeah, should, I don't know, Annie, should we wait a couple of more minutes because of the change in time as well? Maybe just, I see people connecting sure. all the time. Yeah, maybe just a couple of minutes and then we start with the greetings. Um, only Dorothy, if you could please check if Maria Barlu uh, has managed to join us because she's going to uh, speak uh, directly after me. So we we need her to be here. Thank you. I think we should start because people may keep coming in all the time. So, <laughs> all right. Um, good afternoon. Again, my name is Anne Mitropoulou. I'm the executive director of the Cyclades Preservation Fund. So on behalf of my team and, and all the members of our association, I would like to warmly welcome you to this second environmental webinar which is organized by the CPF with the support of the British Embassy in Athens in the context of the CPF initiative, Green Volunteers in the Cyclades. So this is the second part of a series of four English speaking webinars designed from our team for people who really want to learn how to have a more positive ecological impact on the islands, but aim to engage visitors and lovers of the Cyclades, I guess people like you, in actions and initiatives with a positive impact. So visitors and long or short term residents are therefore invited and encouraged to become volunteers and active citizens through small or bigger actions that support the local champions of the Cyclades and organizations who in turn share their experience and wisdom through this series of CPF webinars. On the previous one, on the 15th of February, we hosted the webinar focusing on the Aegean ecosystem the lessons and actions we need to take to protect the sea. Today, we will uh, have these uh, wonderful special guests who will teach us more about the language of the Cycladic nature. And we have two more webinars in the pipeline, one dedicated on the value of local participation, which will take place on the 15th of March. And the last one will focus on the practices that we should follow to become more, let's say, eco-visitors, which will take place on the 29th of March. So you are all, of course, welcome to register and jo join us uh, there too. Before I close this very short uh, welcome speech on behalf of the CPF, let me just say, in case you don't know who we are, that we are a Greek nonprofit association, originally established as a UK charity, focusing on the empowerment of the local communities of the Cyclades, because we believe that enabling local resources can make a strong positive impact and bring about serious lost lasting change, long lasting change. To this end, we raise funds to support conservation projects of local entities, as well to run campaigns and educational activities. So in five years of operation in the Cyclades, uh, more than uh, five, uh, four, sorry, 100,000 euros have been invested in more than 65 environmental initiatives in collaboration with more than 40 local partners in 20 Cycladic islands. And of course, there is still much work to be done. At the CPF, we try to ensure that the funds we raise by donors, local businesses, or other foundations are all directed appropriately, supporting the most effective preservation projects and campaigns. If you want to learn more, our website is www.cycladespreservationfund.org. After working on the ground for five years now, it has become clear to us that there is on one hand a need for committed volunteers and supporters to make their long-term efforts a reality and allow local initiatives to grow. And on the other hand, a need for more informed visitors and residents about how they, you, can support local initiatives and protect the natural environment by making the right choices when it matters the most. Allow me please also to close this short speech by thanking the British Embassy in Athens for their trust and wonderful partnership, 
I would like also to thank our local partners and experts and guests for today. Mrs. Elena Simeonidou, Mr. Marius Fornaris from Alkioni, and Mrs. Olga Karagiannis from Andros Roots. And last but not least, allow me please to thank my colleagues, Mrs. Dorothy Filiotti and Mrs. Nasia Casella, um, who will also moderate the webinar today. Thank you very much. Enjoy. And thank you for staying with us and supporting our work and our partners. I don't know if Mrs. Maria Barlu, Dr. Maria Barlu from the British Embassy, Athens is here to take the floor. Otherwise, she will join us later on. Dorothy, do you know if Mrs. Barlu is here? I don't see her. She, will, she, she won't be uh, sharing an address. She'll join us later. All right. I'm sure the British Embassy sends their warmest regards when we can start. Then, uh, Nasia Mu, with, with you taking the floor. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. A uh, warm welcome also uh, by me. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, we spend a few more minutes to wait for people to log in. There are still people uh, connecting. We're around 50 people. We had more than 150 registrations, but we hope that those who couldn't make it today uh, because of the change of date that was really important for us, we couldn't uh, perform the webinar last week um, for the reasons that we're all uh, well aware of. We hope that they will be able to follow this uh, webinar maybe in the recording later on uh, to learn all the important things that all of you will be learning today. So today we will be talking about the vulnerable ecosystems of the Cycladis and the native flora, about the walking routes, that are very important for the cycladic landscape and the dry world uh, structures, as well as about uh, as well as about wildlife in the cyclades. We will have three presentations. After each presentation, we will be showing you a short video. Then we will have a Q and A section, and then a short break uh, between the first and the second presentation and the second and the third presentation, in order for us to all take a breath and be able to focus more on what our experts will be presenting to us. So because we started a little bit late, uh, I think we should go ahead and uh, start with Elena Smeonidou. I will be introducing Elena and then she will take the floor to give her presentation. So Elena Smeonidou will talk to us about native flora and vulnerable ecosystems in the Cyclades. Elena is an expert in ecological regeneration and she will guide us through the basics of reading the Cycladic landscape. She will make an introduction to the island ecosystems and help us all understand the threats that island nature is under and what we can do to help nature thrive. Through her years of experience in ecological management work in the Cyclades and through her multiple collaborations with entities on the ground, Elena will offer us practical knowledge and propose actions that can help us align with the well-being of nature. She will also invite us all to contribute to knowledge gathering with our own sightings of rare species in the area, any way that us all can help. Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you and hello and thank you. Most of all, I thank the CPF for this wonderful opportunity to be with all these nice people here today. I will start sharing my screen. Give me one minute to see if this works as expected. Yes, it's good now, Alan. Great. So, my name is Elena Simeonidou. I, uh, I have been living in the Cyclades for 13 years now. I live in the island of Paros. And um, although I'm trained as an engineer and a cinematographer, uh, at some point uh, I made a U-turn in my career and I delved into agroecology and permaculture. And then uh, I was living abroad, but I was drawn back to my homeland. And um, I, I landed in the Cyclades and uh, I chose to stay here because uh, like many of you, I think, that are present here, became, I became fascinated and enchanted, I could say, uh, by this corner of the world. And since, since I arrived, since the beginning, uh, I got involved in a land restoration project in the Environmental and Cultural Park of Paros, uh, about which I think you will see a snippet of a video later on, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
Uh, so I will not talk about much about I will not talk much about it, but you will see a little bit of what we are doing there uh, from the video. And thanks to this project, mostly to this project, I became an amateur botanist, and I also pursued pursued further studies because of this, or thanks to this, uh, in climate change and biodiversity management. And during this journey, I was fortunate enough to uh, cross paths with the Cyclades Preservation Fund. And for the last five years, we have joined forces running some amazing projects. Uh, I, I really uh, feel privileged and lucky to be able to be in this adventure with these amazing ladies uh, of the CPF. And what I will try to do now is not, not really teach, but teach you anything that you probably don't know, but I will, I will try to, to share uh, some of the reasons uh, that I'm so fascinated about the Cyclades. First of all, I would like to zoom out a little bit and see, uh, see the, the broader context. So uh, the Mediterranean Sea can be seen as an inland sea, but can, it, can only be, it can also be seen, and I, I wish us to see it, as a region where continents meet. And uh, this fact, this junction, plays out in three different ways. Uh, it plays out uh, via geology, via climate, and by, via human activity. Um, the geological history of this place is very complex, and uh, the product of it is many islands, not only the islands uh, in the Aegean Sea, but also all across the Mediterranean. And um, as I said, the climate is the second factor. And third, and probably uh, the most important uh, for the last century is human activity. Nowhere else in Europe has there been such a long history of human presence. And um, especially, particularly in the Eastern Mediterranean, where we are. We are here, I am here, and a few of us are here, a few of us that are uh, uh, watching this uh, webinar. And um, the Cycladic Archipelago uh, is in the Aegean Sea, as this nice red blue dot there. And um, it has been the stage for um, a dramatic, dramatic geological events and also uh, a constant evolution and um, movement of uh, all living things, animals, plants, and humans alike. And it is the crossroads of three continents, which is very important for all three uh, factors that I mentioned. I love this photograph uh, of the, uh, from the, the aerial of the International Space Station because it gives us a little bit of a different perspective of the Cyclades and also uh, gives us an idea of the interaction between land and sea and wind and all the other physical elements that, uh, that, are, are, that are at play. Uh, there are about 20, 220 islands um, in the Cyclades, but the major ones, the inhabited ones, are, um, I think, about 24, 25, something like that. And they're most probably, uh, each, each island is an eroded summit of a mountain. And at some point in the geological history, they were uh, um, connected between themselves with the land bridges. At some point, the Mediterranean also emptied. Uh, of water and then it filled up again and then the Gibra Gibraltar closed so it's very very dramatic what's uh, has been happening here um it's this photograph also gives us an idea about insularity uh, being an island uh, being a piece of land that is uh, uh, um engulfed in water being uh, being around the uh, water having water all around it rather and uh, it's, it's very important that these islands are in close proximity. We're not in the Pacific Island a, a Ocean. We're not in a, in a, in a vast sea where um, islands, uh, where it is difficult to navigate. Actually, the navigation has been facilitated by this proximity because like you could do island hopping even in the ancient times, as we do today with the boats. 
um, because you could see, you could uh, really see your destination or even if you wanted to go to the next or the, the, the island after the next, you could just do um, a scala, a, a, a scal, a, a cabotage, I think it's called, I'm not entirely sure in English. Uh, so you could go uh, from island to island and uh, actually uh, be connected with all of it and the, con the con continental Greece and also the, the shore of Asia Minor, what is today, today's Turkey. Um, okay, let's talk about geology a little bit. This is a rather um, complicated map, but I would like to, to show you a few things. This is uh, the big, um, the big, the line, the trench where the three plates meet the three continental plains, plain, plates meet. So the Eurasian plate, the Anatolian plate and the African plate, they are in constant movement. And you can see with these arrows, uh, the direction of the movement. So they approach each other. And uh, well, the projection of this line uh, is actually what is the epicenter of the recent devastating earthquake in Turkey and Syria. So this is a very, very active uh, area geologically. The red triangles are volcanoes. And just as an example, uh, we could talk about the, the, the eruption of the volcano in Santorini in 1600 before the Christian era. So in late Bronze Age, uh, where there has been, this eruption has affected the whole area immensely. You can see here the volcanic deposits um, in a vast area um, of the, it basically covered all the Aegean and part of the, of the continental Greece and all the Anatolian uh, area, peninsula, and part of Middle East. So, you know, uh, we're talking about uh, cycladic ecosystems. Can you imagine how an event like that affected um, the, the, soil, the, the soil, the vegetation, and of course the human settlements. There were uh, entire cities that were uh, uh, destroyed completely, like the Akrotiri uh, city, one of the cities of Santorini. So, um, Geology plays a, has played a significant role in, in, the, in the whole area and it still plays like all of these factors we have to, you know, we have to be clear that plays, has, have played a significant role in the past, but also in the present. Uh, Santorini has been moving upwards, has been inflating all these years and only uh, in one year between 2011 and 2012, there was a, a study and it just moved vertically uh, like the, the island of Kameni, which is here has moved vertically uh, for about 14 centimeters. And this, this, this red dot is the volcano itself. And the last earthquake in Santorini was as recently as in 1856 and it had a magnitude of 7.7 .7 or 7.8 date, something like that, with an epicenter near Amorgos, and there was even a local tsunami. So uh, this is an important factor, and we have to always uh, think about it, that we are in a very, very active area. The second, uh, the second factor that we talked about is climate. So um, as the Aegean is, as I said, the crossroads of three continents, the crossroads of three continents, this uh, uh, plays out also in, uh, in in the climate. So there has there are influences of all the neighboring climates uh, of, um, of yeah of all the neighboring areas. And okay, the the climate of the of the, the Cycladis is the typical Mediterranean climate. The main characteristic of of it is that there are two distinct seasons. And we have a dry season in the summer that, that, is, um, that has a, a drought. So there is no precipitation at all. And this affects uh, significantly the flora of, uh, of the area. Uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's a, a hot, dry summer. Uh, as, uh, so 
different from a hot, humid summer that would be in the tropics. Um, there have been fluctuations, but generally speaking, the climate has been steady for the last 10,000 years or so, and so the vegetation also moved um, and changed uh, through these, uh, these years, and I will explain uh, later how it changed. So already uh, we can see that the, the colors here don't really matter at the like, but you can see so much. Uh, what it matters more is that we you can see the uh, span of the Mediterranean climate around around the sea, and also the other climates and how um, and the vicinity, the proximity also that affects uh, the climate in the Cycladus. So as a result of that, we have uh, a great, uh, we, we have a hot spot of plant biodiversity. In absolute numbers, it's not amazing, uh, but um, the percentage um, of, the bio, of, of the plants that exist in the Cycladus compared to the area of the Cycladus is astonishing. So we have 1,600, 61 plants, so 1,661 plants in the in the cycladis that are identified. In the whole of Greece, we have around 6,600, and in non-continent, in non-Mediterranean Europe, we have only 6,000. So you can see uh, um, the differences here. So the cycladis uh, comprise only two percent of the total surface of Greece, but they account for 25 percent of the plant diversity. Another very important characteristic is the uh, what we call the endemism of, uh, of uh, the flora. What are the endemic plants? Endemic plants are the plants that exist only in one area and no, nowhere else in the world. And the percentage in the Cycladis is, uh, is quite, uh, quite big because we have uh, the, what we said, the insularity, so uh, sends a, an isolation for uh, big ge geological periods. Um, and also many microclimates and uh, mosaic landscapes that, um, that are influenced by factors as the wind or the slope or the variable terrain and, and so on and so forth. So in the Cycladis we have plants from the tropics and also plants even from alpine climates. So we have a, a vast array um, of plants co-inhabiting in these little rocks uh, in the Aegean Sea. And as I said about the geology, uh, climate also is a factor that will actually be very significant in the coming years. Uh, climate change is here. It is. Uh, it's a fact. I have seen the effects of it in the 12, 12, 13 years that I've been here, and you can see here a projection of the climate in twenty in twenty seventy, and there is the 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 light blue color is the the hot summer Mediterranean climate, and you see that as we move towards twenty seventeen, uh, the hot summer Mediterranean climate uh, takes the place of the warm summer Mediterranean cli climate, which is this turquoise color. And the, this purple color, which is this, the uh, hot semi-arid climate, the climate of the Middle East and the Northern Africa, creeping in. And what's the gateway? It's the Cycladus, basically. So, and well, I would, in, in other, um, uh, studies you have you see also the eastern eastern Crete that is also um, the a gate of uh, the hot uh, arid semi-arid climate. Uh, well, the desert comes to Europe through the Cycladus. This is uh, and 2070 is not very far. So it is important that we. Uh, we can no longer speak so much about um, climate change mitigation as about climate change adaptation. So what we have to do is to find ways to adapt to the changes and there are ways to do it, or at least we have to try. 
okay, I change the tone a little bit. I'm sorry, but this has to be said. We have to be ready to the extent that we can. A question that I'm asked very, very often is, are there forests in the Cycladis? And uh, I have many, uh, many discussions, heated discussions with people that say, what, the Cycladis are not green. There's just no forest there. And although this may be scientifically kind of true, my answer in this question is always, yes, there are forests in Cycladis. Uh, and I don't care if it's not scientifically uh, correct or accurate, because it largely depends on how you define a forest. And actually, according to the Greek state, uh, vast areas of the Cyclades are forest. Uh, well, so the law, I, like uh, in face of the law, they are kind, they are forest. Um, the Greek state aside, um, there are very often clusters of trees, uh, of important trees that maybe in the past uh, used to uh, form large forests. It is not proven and there is debate in science about that. But today there are uh, these clusters, these thickets of, uh, of trees, um, like the, the little forest of oak trees uh, that uh, there is in K actually, it is the only one that is significantly big in uh, in the Cyclades. Very often you find terms like maquis or ga garig vegetation, frigana, frigana vegetation, or matoral in uh, Spanish. So um, we're talking about open spaces, dehesa, another word that is uh, uh, also used in Spanish and uh, in the literature in general. So we have clusters of trees um, and open spaces that are covered with uh, annual vegetation. Uh, I, I keep saying the word trees, but sometimes it's not trees. They're not, uh, they are defined as shrubs, so big shrubs low or a bit a bit uh, like medium height shrubs and uh, they have uh, specific characteristics so they are perennial most of the times they are woody they have uh, woody mass and their leaves are hard they're leathery or furry or spiky or a combination of all these because uh in an effort to prevent water transpiration, so in, in an effort to, to keep as much water as possible, and also to prevent animals from grazing them. And another very nice and important feature is that the majority of these plants, they grow in winter and spring, and they sleep in summer. So we don't talk about hibernation, we talk about estivation. This is, uh, this is where the plants choose to stop growing and stop many of their uh, functions uh, because in order to survive the, the hot and dry summer months. Uh, so um, another one in another kind of forest uh, uh, in, in Naxos here, we saw uh, the one in Kia he, here. Um, it is um, um, uh, a forest or um, a habitat of the of the juniper juniper macrocarpa. We'll talk a lot more about this uh, very very soon. And there is, as I said, a combination of evergreen, semi evergreen, which is very interesting, and deciduous species. So species that uh, lose their leaves uh, in winter and uh, they they. Uh, have them again in summer, but most of the plants today, they're evergreen, the big plants, the shrubs and the trees, they're evergreen or same evergreen. So, so they never lose the whole, the, all of their leaves, but some of them. And these, these a nice pair is, is a very beautiful pair. I love it. It's a, one, one a tree of the maple family. Uh, but with that keeps its leaf, Acers and Pervidens, it exists in Crete, in Tinos, in Andros, and it, it's very often seen together with the Quercus Taborensis and the Valonia oak, uh, uh, an oak tree that is struggling to survive uh, in, in the cyclades. We have like in Paros, we have five trees or, 
or eight, I don't know, we are like, we know them and we uh, uh, cherish them. And the, the forest in Kea is uh, comprised of Quercus and Thaburensis. And of course, we have the usual suspects. We have uh, carob trees, we have uh, pistachia, the mastic trees, uh, of course, the olive tree. What, what can I say? Now, I, I will talk. I see that the time flies. So I will talk about the, the, the third uh, most important factor uh, that affects the Cycladic um, ecosystems, and it is, it is the human factor. At least for the last century, this has been uh, the most important factor that uh, uh, defines uh, the, the, the ecosystems. But there, there is a nice story I can, I can tell you about Iraklia in the third century before Christ, before the Christian era. Um, in Iraklia, in the, uh, at that time, uh, there is only one inscription that, is, that, uh, is, that exists from, from this island. And it's very interesting because it's, it reveals a situation of crisis for the local community. It seems that there was a law that was forbidding the import and feeding of goats on the island of Iraklia, import and feeding. So trans, what we call transhumans, there were uh, apparently as it happens in goat islands from, from the, the Homeric times actually, uh, since uh, um, like until today, um, animal herds would be uh, transported to uh, usually uh, in uninhabited islands left there for several months to graze and then they would be taken back uh, to be slaughtered for meat or for or uh, for uh, milk products like cheese and, and the rest and in Iraklia there they made this inscription where they said that um, there was somebody who came illegally and brought the animals there and there was violence and this someone uh, killed killed uh, a, a, an inhabitant of the island and what they decided to do is that is to uh, to to pursue the prosecution of this person and to pay as a whole community not only the citizens of Rakhila but even the, even the slaves or the visitors of the island so that they would share the cost of this uh, prosecution and uh, and it, it's it's in quite harsh harsh language uh, also. Uh, so this was a very serious matter. They wanted to de to defend their island from uh, what could be an important danger for the whole of the ecosystem. Iraklia is a small island, and uh, well, uh, one can speculate that uh, this. Uh, um, violator was either from Amorgos or Naxos because at the time these were rich islands with uh, more than one cities that were very active in uh, in uh, pastoralism. The Naxos still is because there is still water and vegetation, Amorgos not so much. Um, so um, this gives you an idea of how important grazing was uh, and we know very well, whoever has uh, traveled uh, around the islands knows very well um, what the landscape looks like uh, from overgrazing. These are not photographs from the Cycladis, they are from Icaria, but you can see uh, what uh, overgrazing or unmanaged grazing can do. The photograph on the right uh, shows you an area which is uh, grazed uh, in, in, in a way like freely and another area that is not grazed, just separated by one fence. So it's the difference is dramatic. Um, food production is not only animal rearing, it's just plain cultivation um, and uh, very often cultivation of cereals. Uh, the, the, the landscape of the Cyclades is really handmade. And um, I know that Olga is going to talk more about, uh, about the terraces and the stone walls, the dry stone walls uh, that separate these terraces. And these really make it possible for people to cultivate their, their food, not now, 
but for centuries, we for, for some of these uh, terraces and stone walls, we don't even know their age. It could be even ancient. Uh, and it seems like there, there was a certain balance and uh, there were sustainable systems at place uh, in the past. Uh, I show you here a photograph of uh, Tinos Island with uh, terraces again, and also the famous dovecots, the pigeon houses. Again, we have a, an amazing system where uh, people were rearing pigeons and for their meat, but also for their manure, which was uh, you know, equivalent to gold uh, as a fertilizer for, uh, for cultivation, for agriculture at the time, especially very rich in phosphorus. And we lack phosphorus in uh, cycladic soils, in, in alkaline soils. Um, so there, there were many systems in place where people in small amounts, in populations that could uh, that the land could sustain, uh, could have a good living. And as a neighbor of mine says, uh, even when he recounts stories in the 50s, he says, we didn't have money, but we had everything. So I think this was, this is the gist of how it went for many, many centuries around here. This has changed abruptly in the last 50 or to 70 uh, years. And this is the most important factor of uh, human influence uh, on the islands in the last years, over tourism. Um, these photographs are not, are just 50 years apart and you can see, um, you can see the difference. It is a dramatic difference. Uh, the settlements uh, become huge, they unite and all the free land is uh, littered, literally by, uh, by, buildings, mostly um, holiday homes uh, or hotels. Holiday homes is something more recent. Hotels used to be the norm in the past or rooms to let. And this land use change is the single most important factor for the degradation of island ecosystems. Read the literature, it's, it's, it's everywhere and at, in a way, it is also um, irreversible. While you could reverse some of the impact of agriculture, uh, it's very difficult to reverse the impact of uh, building on overbuilding, over construction, if this term exists uh, in, in, Greek, in English. And I will close with um, a concrete example of how over tourism and building can affect the, the, the plant uh, communities and the, the local flora. This is, I, I talked about this, uh, this plant is Juniperus macrocarpa. This is my all time favorite plant in Cyclades. I think it's an emblematic plant. Uh, although um, its distribution is all over Greece, I like we call it here Cycladic cedar, Cycladeticos kedros. Uh, it's not a cedar, it's a juniper, uh, so it's in the Cypress family. Um, but it, it is supposed to have covered vast areas of the Cyclades in the past. Um, and uh, it is in real danger. You see here uh, the specific uh, spots where it exists in, um, in, in, in the South Aegean. And one of its major functions is to stabilize the shores, to stabilize the sand dunes, to stabilize the precious beaches that we are so fond of and that we sell as one of our most important products in, in tourism. And you can see here how a healthy beach ecosystem looks like. So you have the shore, you have this, this area where like, you know, we would love to hang around and uh, enjoy sea and sun. And then behind you would have the primary vegetation zone, the incipient dune, and then you would pass through the frontal dune. This is one of the most important features of the, of the beach ecosystem, of the shore ecosystem. 
And this is where usually uh, Juniperus macrocarpa resides. And then you would continue further inland with more, um, uh, with, uh, more diverse vegetation. Uh, this is what a degraded beach ecosystem looks like. This is one of the habitats of the major, most important habitats of Juniperus uh, macrocarpa in Paros Island. It's no longer habitat. It's highly fragmented. It's basically devastated. This area that you see here, this white patch, is a wetland. I hope that Marius will talk a little bit about wetlands. I mean, I believe he has to because, like, birds are the, the, the kings and queens of these habitats, and we have loads of them in Cyclades. But this uh, wetland uh, in Santa Maria Beach, uh, it is. Um, a naturally dried, well, not really naturally, but usually it is dry in summer. It is dried because it is also drained uh, artificially by people. And this serves as a, the parking lot of all these people that enjoy their sea and sun drinks in the beach bars. And we recently we talk about uh, about the disease that has uh, uh, affected that is uh, attacking uh, the juniperus uh, this juniper uh, uh, in Paros and Naxos at least and probably in other islands in other Cycladic islands too. We 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 there is a debate uh, among the scientists that it might be a fungus or it might be uh, an insect, but the most important uh, enemy of this plant is not an insect or a fungus, it's human impact. Uh, here I, sh I show you how this same plant exists in Hrissi Island, the uh, little island uh, south of uh, Crete, uh, east, southeast of Crete, uh, where it's equally, um, so where it equally uh, suffers from over tourism. On the left, you can see how the roots of these plants are completely exposed from uh, human impact, from vehicles that go back and forth uh, on the island every day. Th hundreds, if not thousands of people uh, come to the island by boat and they stay the whole day and they, and they uh, enjoy the place. The, the, the one that doesn't enjoy, and enjoy the place any longer is the junipers. The, there are some brave people over there who managed to ban uh, activities in Hrissi Island for the near future. And this is a photograph further inland on the, on the right, uh, where the system is left untouched. And during uh, winter, the sand dunes have recuperated and because of the, of the movement, uh, it's covered uh, roots again, and the island has a hope of um, of recuperating, and the the plants the plants also. Elena, so um, yes, do we have many more slides to go? Because no. ah, okay, okay, great. go on, go on. Okay. <laughs> so this is just one example. Um, I've been asked to to uh, come up with ideas of what one can do. When, when they come uh, to the Cycladic Islands uh, for either as tourists or visitors, or uh, well, if they have a house there, or if they, they plan to have a house in, in a holiday house there. Uh, at first, a simple thing that we could do is if we see a juniper like that, um, to take a, sna a snapshot of it, take a photograph of it, and share your. Uh, your your observation, share your photo um, in, in iNaturalist, in the application iNaturalist, where we have starting putting together a little project, uh, trying to um, map uh, the junipers of the Cyclades. It's, it's in very early stage, but uh, you will have more information uh, in the support uh, material that uh, we will give you uh, following up this uh, webinar. So this would be already an, a very important thing. Just take a photo of it. And there will be um, experts inside the app that will verify whether it is uh, a juniper macrocarp or whatever, what, another juniper, another plant, doesn't matter. It's equally important. 
but this is a simple one. Then there are other things that we could do. Uh, and uh, apart from the obvious ones, I would I would suggest kindly suggest to avoid coming in during peak season. You will have a much better experience anyway. The quality of the of your experience will be better. You will come in contact with locals and with people that are actually uh, inhabit the island and uh, and care for it. Um, you could, whether you are a tourist or uh, you know. Uh, uh, a person who lives here for some part of the year or for the whole year, you could nudge businesses and the local authorities, even more importantly, towards uh, protecting what is important and precious in the island. I would dare say also, do not build, renovate. There are amazing houses uh, in, in all the Cycladic settlements that would love to be renovated and uh, be like brought back to life. Consider this. Uh, and last but not least, uh, when you create gardens in your houses, in your holiday homes, look for native plants, look for local, or local nurseries that have native plants. There are a few uh, on, the, on the islands. And you know they can also uh, uh, send plants to other islands. So look for that, try to minimize the invasive plants that come in the fragile ecosystems and uh, try to even artificially augment the, the populations of the native plants of the island. Thank you very much. I hope I gave you some leads of uh, how to act and what to do. Um, I will be at your disposal for any questions, hopefully in the like after the video. Thank you, Elena. So you've given us a great uh, introduction into how the geology and climate and the human factor have shaped the landscape and the flora of the Cyclades. Thank you very much for that. So taking us through the geological history and recent history of how the grazing and the cultivation and the change of land use have, uh, have resulted in what we see today, uh, both positively and negatively, because it is a really rich uh, ecosystem. Um, that has been under a lot of human pressure, but still there are uh, amazing and interesting and uh, unique uh, flora species to see. Um, we will have a short video play now. We will see some uh, small interventions that have been done in the Paros Park, uh, the protected peninsula at the Ayanis that is in Paros, where Elena was also part of this uh, initiative. And uh, in the meantime, I would like to ask you uh, if you have any questions to put them on the chat so we can have a short Q&A session after the video and then go to a small break before we continue with Olga. Thank you. Do we have sound? I'm not. Oh, sorry. Right, share sound. I forgot that part. One second. My name is Elena Simeonidou and I am doing environmental management in the Paros Cultural and Environmental Park. It is important to protect and preserve all the island, but what is special about the Paros Park is that it is an area quite big for the scale of the island. Building is prohibited, hunting is prohibited, there is no longer animal grazing, there is no longer agriculture, so the ecosystem has a chance 
to recuperate. The park is a, a quite important place because it brings people together, people who want to preserve the, this peninsula to um, keep it as intact as possible. Paros Park is currently working on a new botanical garden to collect and preserve native plants. Our vision for the botanical garden is to create um, a hub in the Cyclades where people can talk about the Cycladic flora as it used to be. We will try to gather as many native plants as possible. Uh, we started with the most prominent ones, all the, the herbs that are quite famous and also quite useful and also plants that are medicines. So it's a first step to try to collect them all in one place and then start talking about their significance. There are a lot of plants that uh, face danger um, of extinction, so we would like to gather as many of them as possible. We planned this botanical park in an effort to draw attention to all the native plants and endemic plants of the Cyclades in general, that they're under a lot of pressure due to construction, to building, to development, and also to climate change. We have seen the effects of climate change uh, already uh, on the island. And when you have a closed ecosystem and a closed society, uh, it's quite easy to see the, the, the effects. So it's quite important to gather as many native plants as possible and uh, show them to the public. What we would like to see about the park is to uh, become a, a place of cooperation, of collaboration towards the direction of sustainable tourism, where people relax, enjoy nature. You can do this in, in any beach, yes, but uh, this, this kind of scenery and this, the infrastructure we have offers much more. And we would like to give an example also to other uh, touristic destinations of how it could be. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, we have some questions in the in the chat, so we'll go through through them quickly so that Elena can answer uh, before we go to a break. Or if there are many, we'll see. Uh, we'll take a break and then continue in the discussion in the end. So uh, Barbara is asking: Is there any initiatives to reduce overgrazing that you might know of? It's not easy to reduce overgrazing because the, the grazers, like the, the people who are doing, uh, who are past, like doing agriculture, animal rearing these days is dwindling. Uh, the, the problem is that, the, and you can't reduce overgrazing when the European Union is subsidizing uh, her grazing animals at the same time. You can't uh, force uh, people who, whose livelihood uh, sort of depends on that to, um, to, to reduce the number of animals. I have tried, uh, we, then there have been uh, efforts to change the system, the grazing system, because uh, the answer is not just reducing the animals. If, if you change the grazing system, that would be... Um, a real solution, actually, that would be a win-win situation. But I, I don't, I'm not aware of uh, of any such initiatives uh, in the in the Cycladis, to be honest. Not even well, maybe something happens in Crete, but I'm not really sure. Thank you, Elena. Then there is a comment by Mark. Uh, he says that for identifying plants as a hobby botanist, one could check out the application Flora Incognita that uses AI, artificial intelligence, to identify the plants. And there is an English language setting. And it also maps out the finding locations and plant densities found. Uh, Mark, the reason why we propose uh, iNaturalist, I don't know Flora Incognita, but I've used a couple of applications uh, like that in the past. And it's actually interesting because you take a photo and then it shows you, I mean, if this one works similarly, it shows you maybe 10 alternatives of similar 
plants and then you say yes this is the one I found and you uh, find information about the specific plant. Uh, iNaturalist is a, is a base that is also used by scientists and this is why we, we suggest it uh, in order to, um, to perform in kind of a citizen science approach where each of us can give this information that can be gathered in a database and eventually be used for uh, analysis and possibly management measures if a plant is of interest for uh, preservation reasons. So this is why we're suggesting the AI naturalist and why this new project for the um, Juniper, Elena, has started uh, recently there. But there are plenty Dorothy. of projects. Yeah. Dorothy has started. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there are plenty of uh, of projects um, for Greek uh, for Greek flora, and uh, there are some groups. I don't know if we have uh, uh, Mr. Taklis with us here today that they have tens of thousands of members who are registering this information, and that these gathered uh, databases can be used for uh, for research as well. Um, and if I may, I'm not I'm not aware of this app, and I will be happy to take to take to have a look what is important in iNaturalist is that there are experts identifying the plants so you have real humans not uh, that can identify can make the proper and the identification which is important because there is so much like there are debates uh, it is important for the scientific reasons at least then we have a few people asking about local flora we have uh... Nina asking if there is any page that shares information, maybe lists of flora and fauna that is local on the specific islands. And uh, Telis would also like a list of native plants. Um, and John and Jean are asking if there would be a list of places one can get these plants if they would like to add them in a garden. And thank you, Philip, for uh, sharing a guide for the biodiversity in Amorgos on the chat for anyone to see. Uh, but Elena, if you have some guidance or information on this. We will give you uh, the sources. I will give you all the sources uh, uh, that are that I know of that are available. There are there has been extremely important and amazing uh, botanists work in the in the in the whole of the Aegean. This is a place where scientists love to come and uh, and do their work. You know, so there there are um, lists of plants for even for parts. I will give you the I will give you the the sources for all of that. And yes, um, Namorgos, they have, they are doing an amazing, there is a, a group of people that they are doing an amazing work and it's all also available on the internet. So Namorgos is a lucky one. And we, like, we're not so far, the other islands are not so far uh, from that. So anybody can benefit from the public work that, that is um, available online. And we will give you the sources. How is, yeah, I suppose what is meant here is how does landscape design and the selection of plants fit or not into a design for a construction and a permitting for a construction? It is completely unregulated. There is nothing that uh, prevents any plant coming. And indeed, we have a lot of years uh, that have come, a lot of invading invasive plants that have come from, uh, from overseas, from uh, uh, businesses uh, in, Everywhere, Italy, Athens, or uh, that uh, bring plants and create garden gardens here. There is no regulation that I know of that regulates that. This is why I'm saying it's it really depends on the individual to to go this direction. And and yes, we can give you, although it's like an advertisement, but we about we can give you a few sources of of uh, or nurseries that um, are working. Although I'm not sure I, I know of everybody in the Cycladis that does this. I know in Paris, I know in Milos, in Kimolos, I know, I know some, uh, some nurseries, uh, but where you can go to any nursery and ask specifically for Cycladic plants and Mediterranean plants, and they will try to accommodate you. There are a lot out there, even in, in, you know, commercial, uh, commercial nurseries. Okay, then uh, we have a short question by Elizabeth. Yes, Kiria Filioti. Um, what is the source of the Rakila goat story? 
And after that, there is quite some interest on grazing. So I don't know if maybe we should save this as an issue for the discussion in the end. A lot of people uh, talking about this in the, in the chat. And uh, I mean, rotational grazing about the law or Olga makes the reference. So I think we should take that to the final discussion actually. I think it will be interesting for everyone. Elizabeth, um, of course, I will give you and everybody the sources of the of this Heraclea story. There are some people who are doing environmental history for a change. Uh, so it, it has been a theme in the last 20, 30 years, and we have a, a very nice uh, uh, Greek lady in the um, Christi Kostantakopoulou who has been doing research on that, and I, uh, I will give you her work and all, everybody else also. Uh, then Annie is asking, what about its collection? It is interesting that if I'm not wrong, you do not want to encourage people to transfer seeds from one island to the other, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know. This this is uh, this is something that I haven't answered even myself. Um, how what what is to be done? Uh, and I really cannot give a scientific answer. I can give my personal opinion. Um, if the, that nowadays, what I tend to do is that when I know that the that the simply does not exist on a nearby island, and I believe that you know the introduction of it in in some island would be nice, like the Quercus Ithaburensis, for example, the oak, the the Valonia oak, or um, a cedar, uh, the I would I would do it because it's it it is not a plant that can um, uh, settle easily. So, but I wouldn't do that with grasses. I wouldn't do that with with annuals. I wouldn't never do that with annual plants because they they can um, disrupt the the balance, in my opinion. So. Uh, when it comes to trees, I wouldn't mind, but when it comes to annual plants, uh, it's it's a bit more of a problem. Thank you, Elena. Then uh, Vladislav is asking about the climate change and what one can do. Elena, you said that by 2070, climate will be significantly hotter on the Cycladus. What might be the strategy for adaptation to these changes? Reactive, just stay calm and try to save existing flora, or proactive? including reforesting of the island. Is it possible? Should we restrain some farming? I don't know if any bad or good effect from today's farming practices. This is a very big subject. Uh, if, if, I can, if I can answer shortly, one, um, one strategy that is very important is to try to protect. Yes, it has to be reactive. One part has to be reactive. We have to protect, especially the endemic plants especially those, because they are the genetic pool, the, the very, very important pool of DNA that can that maybe uh, can provide uh, plants that are more, ad more adapted to the, to the future um, circumstances. So one thing is that, at least this is what scientists uh, suggest. Uh, then of course, reforesting is possible and it, it, this is just, uh, you know, uh, a matter of decision, of political decision, basically. And this is a very huge uh, problem, as you understand, especially when land, uh, when real estate is so precious. Uh, at, this, uh, at this time, uh, the, the land is, just, in the cyclist is getting very, very precious and uh, pricey. Uh, and it goes towards tourism rather than reforestation. So th there is, we have to find the balance. Thank you, Elena. And we have uh, two questions uh, that go into the overdevelopment and uh, road opening. I'll give them to you one by one because they're long. So Laurie asks, um, if overdevelopment is the major problem, what possible things can we as property owners do? Over the last 30 years, I have seen that the infrastructure on Tinos, water, sewage systems, parking, etc., is not adequate for the number of visitors. Is there any initiative for limiting the number of visitors, owners? How about for limiting the building style of new buildings, swimming pools, big water consumers, etc.? Actually, I think it well, combines with Pierre's question. I will, I will also read you yeah. uh, Pierre's question. Um, hello, do we have an idea about quantity and impact of the building of both legal and illegal roads on the islands? 
how many kilometers of roads are opened every year or during, let's say, the last 10 years? And do we have an idea about the ground, soil, artificialization size? I don't know what this means, but I, I hope you understand yeah. that. Yeah. It is all a matter of legislation. It's very difficult to regulate it uh, in, a, in another way. It's uh, like <laughs> an easy suggestion would be to, to do what all the other civilized countries do, that is uh, allow building in the settlements and not in the country, or have very, very strict regulations about building in the countryside. This is not the case in Cycladis. So everybody can build, not or not everywhere, not anywhere, still there are regulations, but uh, uh, until, you know, it, it's not strict enough. And um, so uh, the, the impact, there are, there are several studies about, uh, about the impact uh, of um, overbuilding or roads. And uh, I guess that maybe Olga will, Olga will touch upon this when, uh, she talks a little bit about um, wind turbines and the need to open a huge road in order to move uh, the parts of the turtle wind turbines uh, around and uh, on the mountains. So th this is an, a, a very serious um, fragmentation of habitats, especially the opening of the roads. And uh, it really impacts the ecosystems in a, in a, in a, in a huge way. And as I said, it's... it's it, it's, it's probably reversible. So there's no ready answer. It's not, it's not easy. Uh, and uh, well, what you can do if you already uh, are in the, in the system and you already have a house is uh, turn, your, turn your garden into a wild habitat and create a corridor between, uh, between fragments of, um, of uh, natural, of wild nature, of a natural habitat. You can do that. Thank you, Elena. So I'm not sure if I answered everything, but, but we can, we can yes. go uh, again in the end. Yes, I we guess. can go on a, on a break. Uh, we will save for the end discussion the issue of grazing and the new question about uh, soil types and anything else that uh, comes in the meantime. Let's take a short break of uh, five minutes or even 10 minutes. I don't know how everyone is feeling, maybe 10 minutes. And then let's, we'll have a let's break make them on, eight. Let's, let's make them eight. eight so we start. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Let's be back at uh, back 20 past five. 20 past five. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Welcome back. We will continue after this uh, short break with uh, Olga Karajani that will talk to us about the walking routes and handmade drywall landscapes of the Cyclades. Olga is representing the Andros Roots Initiative, an ongoing multi-annual effort of Andros Research Center, a non-for-profit organization that has been formed by volunteers that care and work for the preservation of the natural and cultural heritage of Andros. Since 2012, the volunteers of Andros Roots have cleared, marked, and maintained a network of 200 kilometers of old walking routes across the island of Andros, supporting local culture and sustainable tourism on the island. Active in the initiative since its conceptualization, Olga will share the story of restoring walking trails and discuss how these trails and drywall structures along them link to their surroundings and to the history of the island. She will also tell us how we can contribute to the maintenance of trails and walls when we go trail walking ourselves. Olga, the floor is yours. You can share your screen. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, just give me a moment to... Um, oops. Sorry. The first line. Yeah. Okay. So I hope you can see my screen. Um, before starting, uh, I would like to say a big thank you to CPF and the British Embassy for this lovely initiative to give us the opportunity to share with you uh, the efforts of our organizations for more sustainable cycladic islands. And a big thank you to all of you that you chose to spend this evening to, together with us and discuss uh, about these issues. Uh, to briefly introduce myself, my name is Olga Karayani. I have been living in, on Andros since 2004, almost 18 years now. 
Um, I do not have origins from the island, uh, exactly as uh, Elena described before. I was I was drawn by the beauty and the, the meaningful uh, um, landscape of this island, where my my family had made a second home there. So I left Athens, the place where I was born and studied and worked, uh, and I have moved uh, on Andros. Uh, my my study background uh, is completely is not completely is real is halfway different from what I'm involved right now. I have studied economics. I have a master's degree in sustainable tourism and, and a PhD in sustainable tourism. And I have been working before my life on Andros in the private sector in several positions as an employee, as a freelancer in, in construction and, and in services. So today I will share with you the story of our small organization that was founded in 2009 together with a few more people. Um, the, the organization is devoted to the preservation and creative reuse of the natural and cultural heritage of Andro specifically. Um, so I will share with you the, the story of, of our one of our two ongoing projects, which is the Andros Roots project. And actually it's the story on how we worked to revive the centuries old uh, walking roots of the island. Um, the impact that this uh, project um, had, had, the difference that had, it has made, and to somehow pass some information to, to, to you on how you could possibly contribute to the maintenance of trails while you walk, or even better, uh, how you can get involved and support or, or even develop uh, similar initiatives. Um, as I have been informed that many of you today have, have houses in the Cyclades. Um, so, um, let me, just a second. I don't know if you're seeing this black line here. Okay. So one, one would ask the question, wh why should one care for the walking routes? I mean, wh why one should see value in these routes? And I can answer to you using Andros as an example, of course, we could say that these old walking routes, they, they used to be the veins of all the land uses. Uh, um, if Andros is a body and the land uses were, you know, all, all the, the, the useful things that were happening on the island from the, from the human perspective, is actually these routes was what allowed any human activity to develop. They used to connect all settlements between them with the farming lands, the water locations, religious areas, commercial areas, all fields of human activity for as long as people inhabited the island, they reflect the land planning, these routes, and the importance of every little tiny spot of the island and actually every island and every place that, uh, uh, that has similar routes. Uh, we could say in a line that these old routes are the keys to understanding the landscape today and uh, Let's say a few words about the drivestone wall. You can see the photos of Andros. Um, why should one care about these routes actually belong to the system of, of, of a dry stone wall agricultural civilization? Elena said a few things uh, about the, the long human presence in the Cyclades. In Andros, we know we have constant human presence since the fourth millennia before Christ. These landscapes, many of them could be as old as that. We, we can't unfortunately know exactly how old stone is, stone construction is made of. Um, but actually the dry stone walls, first of all, to know what we are talking about, um, they are constructions that are made with stones without any connecting material between them. So that's why we call them dry stone walls. Sometimes they can be impressive extended systems like terraces for cultivation. Sometimes they can be small, humble constructions and usually they're related to farming. Uh, there are numerous services that dry stone wall construction systems provide for us humans. And let's have a quick look what these are. So uh, Dry stone walls, they, they, they serve as means to organize and improve productive land, mostly in agricultural communities. So dry stone walls are used for property separation. They're obviously used uh, when we speak about terraces 
uh, for holding soil and water, mostly in inclined terrain. Um, dry stone walls were used to create communication and commerce routes, like the ones you saw before on the photos. Um, but also, uh, dry stone wall technique was used to create spaces to store and manage crops, shelter for animals and people as well. So uh, they have been also used as means to manage water for irrigation. And a very important um, service that they, prov they have provided for centuries and they are still providing, although they're not being unfortunately cultivated as much as they used to be, the terraces, they prevent erosion. Um, what they have been doing and still do is to contribute as well to the temperature regulation. Elena uh, mentioned before the, the climate change and the need for all of us to adapt. Um, so the dry stone wall terraces are very important because they preserve humidity, they preserve lower temperatures, um, um, and obviously life, wildlife finds uh, shelter uh, close and next and within the dry stone wall constructions. Uh, and of course, one can easily understand that the terraces contribute the dry stone wall constructions to biodiversity. Uh, um, and provide, they are part of valuable ecosystems. Um, coming to the dry stone walled paths that we have on Andros, another service that they can provide as, 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 as well is as if the, the roots are clean, uh, they can operate as fire protection zones. Um, and of course, in general, one could say that uh, dry stone wall civilization has been a wise example of sustainable living and is still nowadays uh, a very important cultural identity element for the whole area of the Cyclades. To say a few things about Andros, uh, Andros is the, the northest of the, of the Cycladic Islands. One could say is, is, is closer to Evia in terms of, uh, of uh, the landscape and morphology and climate. Um, so almost half of the island is uh, is designated as a nature reserve and natura area which of course testifies for very rich biodiversity um what i already told you is that we have constant human presence on andros since the fourth millennia bc and um, agriculture and animal grazing have been the prevailing human activity almost till the mid 20th century so in there we have an impressive dry stone wall constructions all over the island even at the most steep and remote areas so one can understand that all human stories and works, so the most beautiful and important places of natural and cultural value are to be found around these old walking routes. And, uh, and another, um, let's say, uh, uh, important thing to keep in mind is that uh, the old paths of Andros, in their majority, they are walled. You can see in the photos in this, uh, in this template uh, that we have a wall on the right and a wall on the left that the uh, is also dividing properties. And in between, this is a, a typical route, walking route, old walking route of Andros. And that's why they call them also stenes, steni, which, mean, uh, which means narrow. And many of them are also stone paved, as you can see in, uh, in, in the photos. Uh, here I have a photo from the village where I live. Uh, rarely one, would one expect to see snow in the Cyclades. Andros is an island that almost at least once a year has snow at its mountainous areas. So just for you to understand the different microclimates that exist, uh, that allows for the different crops to be found. Uh, even today, we have apple trees or cherry trees, chestnut trees in, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the village where I live, in the, in the Cyclades. And, and to start saying a few things about how Andros Roots Project started. Uh, of course, it's, it started by walking during the period uh, 2005 and 2009, um, while discovering the old hidden walking routes of Andros, the Andros route idea uh, was born. In the beginning, um, there was a reach out to the local authorities to act and work together for the preservation of these uh, routes. Um, there was a pre-existing project of the regional authorities, a network of 75 kilometers, which was a semi-finished um, uh, one and a largely abandoned one due to, to the lack of local interest of the authorities and the community. There were no waymarks on the mapped routes, although there was a map 
uh, issued, uh, you know, promoting uh, this network for people to come and walk. Um, so uh, there, there have been few travel organizations visiting Andros for walking. There was huge disappointment that stemmed from the lack of preservation of the walking network. Um, and finally, the cease of, of several trips. So to have to give you an idea in photos, what we have found when uh, we started the project, um, you can see in, in it was you can see this is a, a way marked route. Uh, the obviously the, the the network has been blocked in several parts. There were only very few signs placed. Uh, only mostly at the beginning and the end of the routes, having in between several junctions that were not uh, way marked, so people could lose, lose their way. It was not safe and pleasant to walk in routes like that. And uh, what we found in a network of 75 kilometers was just 100 signs and 15 signposts only in Greek. Um, some of the routes were full of waste. You can see on the left a photo. Uh, that was always removed from a specific route that we have to clean. And on the right-hand side photo, you can see uh, a way marked route. You can see the sign on the on the step and a completely blocked route. You can imagine uh, the frustration of somebody attempting to walk uh, in, in on routes like this. And actually, this is one of the most important things also I, I wanted to say is that these projects are when, when one creates a, a walking network, has to realize that this is a temporary um, infrastructure in, in terms that if you have not made plans on how you can preserve uh, and keep it open and, and fully way marked, next year you may not have uh, this network. So it's a very important thing to, to, to plan also for its preservation. You can see photos of blocked routes. So the Anthros routes vision and approach uh, was to make Andros more sustainable, uh, to do so working for a common resource, um, having the non-profit approach, but at the same time attempting to create our own funding to support the maintenance of the routes and the project itself. Um, it was also addressing walking routes as a means to experience and preserve the rich natural and cultural heritage of Andros and its dry stone wall landscape by creatively reusing the old routes. And at the same time, the goal was to have wide local participation and the creation of earnings for the local community, but also to support local, the few local farming families that reside in remote settings of Andros, a precious minority that holds valuable knowledge on, on, on agriculture. Something, okay. So uh, to, to make a short timeline of Andrew's Roots project, in 2009, we have uh, initiated our nonprofit organization named Andros Research Center. On 2010, we started, we launched the Andros Roots project. We had the first voluntary actions. Uh, there was um, a limited attempt to record oral, oral history in one value as a pilot, understand better the landscape and the secrets of the landscape. Between 2010 and 12, we started voluntary actions to clean routes together with other organizations. And in 2013, we made our first step in the direction of creating our own earnings by publishing a walking guide booklet with the contribution of several Andros uh, researchers. Here you can see some photos of our first year's actions. It was mostly together with foreign volunteers to, that came to help us clean routes but also visits to schools to communicate the importance of the landscape preservation. Um, during 2013, um, there was an important step that helped us uh, do more in, in, the, in the coming years. We have attended an important seminar for the leading quality trails best of Europe. It's a quality certification seminar by trainers from the European Ramblers Association. This seminar provided us with knowledge on what are the qualities hikers seek on an area um, and how a region can pursue this quality certification, especially uh, for a long distance route. In 2014, we have published a walking map together with Anavasi. Um, and actually between 2013 and 15, major work started taking place on the routes. We had found help from private people on the island that gave us working hands, gave us materials. So extended work, um, 
together with the support of the European Ramsar Association specialist, because our goal was to pursue this European quality certification. And you can see here photos uh, from uh, waymarking the routes. Um, if you remember, we started with a network of 75 mapped routes. Uh, we extended the network to 160 kilometers. We have placed 4,000 waymarks, 300 wooden signposts, and several direction, and, uh, direction poles. The network is very dense. There were hundreds of junctions. You have to have enough signage for people to walk and also to fulfill the quality certification. You can see here standards. Um, you can see more photos here of the volunteers working. What we have started and we still continue is this, uh, what we call the maintenance walks. Every two weeks, we organize open, uh, open walks. We invite them to come and walk with us. And in the pace of walking, we try to uh, maintain uh, routes together. And from there, we, we find new volunteers and the group of people and local people, not only visitors, is growing. Um, in, uh, when, uh, in 2015, uh, we have a, the voluntary team had increased. We, uh, we managed also to get the European certification uh, in 2015 for the first time. We had created a website in five languages and we have launched our social media. Um, we have cooperated extensively with travel organizations from abroad that they started designing the trips to Andros together with the improvement of the infrastructure. Um, you can see here the Andros route, which is the 100 kilometer route that got the European quality certification. The first time in 2015 is a three year duration certification. We renewed that in 2018 and last year for uh, the third uh, time. Um, this is just uh, the, you can see the, the diagrams, the terrain of Andros is quite uh, intense. So it's a hundred kilometer route that one could walk in 10 days, residing um, in different locations and having luggage transported in these different locations. Here we have the ceremony where we got awarded with the, with the certification. And of course, all these years that we have been thoroughly working for the, um, for the creation of the network and the improvement and extending it. There was um, a lot of publicity that took place um, that I could, I, I could say that happened spontaneously. We didn't really try much to have publicity. It's just out of work. There was interest, there were people coming. There was the word of mouth. So a lot of, a lot of publications in the um, interviews. We have participated also in tourism fairs and we, have seen visitors increase on Andros where we had a very short touristic season, just July and August. We have people come now from April until the end of October. And Andros started being communicated as a uh, quality walking destination. In 2018 and 19, we have attempted a very uh, ambitious uh, organization, the, the so-called Andros on Food Festivals. They were multi-day uh, walking festivals. The first lasted for 23 days, the second for 16 days. We have organized all over Andros every day a walk. Local associations would cook for the people attending the walks at the end of every walk. They were guided visits. Um, and of course, this not only helped Andros um, have more visitors in, in October, because these both events were organized during October, but also I would say it was a very good rehearsal and a very nice experience for local people to see that their areas, their remote villages could be vivid again. Um, they had the opportunity to interact with visitors and realize how precious is the environment they are living in and how the heritage that they still keep and, 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 and the practices they, they use uh, can really become nowadays something that they could help them uh, have a better quality of life and, and keep as much as possible uh, sustainability standards uh, in, the, in their villages. So to, to remind where we started, 2010, you can see the network in yellow line is the, is the network that uh, had no signage at all. Red lines were um, just very few signs in the beginning and end of the routes. Uh, with, so not fulfilling the European quality standards. 
And today we have a network of 200 kilometers, 33 walking routes on Andros, 11 of, of which are circular. To speak about the Andros Routes project today, there are 40 volunteers that take care of the routes, but we, we call them the route angels. We have two volunteers coordinators. We have almost 10 volunteers helping us organize um, and manage the project. Um, we are able now to, to have uh, people also paid to support the office and the finances of the project. We have cooperation with 18 local cultural associations and there are around 50 local businesses that support the project uh, with yearly subscriptions. So the resources come, of course, the volunteers are the most important resource we have, come from private and business subscriptions, sales of booklet and map and other items we have created, support from travel organizations from abroad and sponsorships in, in kind and cash. The COVID period, of course, was a, a stop for, for visitors, but it was not a stop for us. Uh, we worked on improving the network. Uh, we tried to improve the gates. We had bad gates placed mostly by farmers to herd their, their, uh, their goats and, and sheep. So we, we tried to make better doors that were not dangerous. And we maintained uh, the signposts that need every set two years they need to be maintained. We also try to improve our, our team, uh, the knowledge. Um, we, we, we were lucky to have more people on, on, on board of the, of the management group. And um, one person now is responsible for coordinating uh, the volunteers on the, on the spot. We have a person specialized for the social media. And we have constant training of new volunteers uh, and of our staff in, in several fields. We have followed the seminar organized by for the dry stone wall restoration. Unfortunately, I spoke to you about the dry stone walls and the roots, but our uh, efforts, our uh, strength is not enough to restore hundreds of meters of fallen and broken um, dry stone walls. To preserve a network of 200 kilometers is a, is a very big thing. It's very difficult in Andros where vegetation grows very fast. So we are just trying to keep the roots open and try to figure out on ways when we can uh, better do work for the dry stone walls. So we have developed uh, digital tools to record the problems on, of the broken dry stone walls and report uh, the work of the volunteers. You can see here some uh, use of it. Um, Elena mentioned before, yes, there are of course a lot of dangers, and a lot of problems um, related to the dry stone wall um, uh, constructions. Um, we have had severe damages. Of course, illegal open uh, illegal roads being opened is one major danger. Unfortunately, for uh, wind farms, yes, Andros has been of great interest. You can see on the map here the planned installations of huge wind farms um, on, on top of, of mountains. So you can see already on the southern part of the island on the left photo that there have been severe works to place to make uh, roads to place the, the wind turbines in an area which is protected for birds also. It's like a crazy placement of, um, of, uh, of, wind, uh, of wind farms. Uh, what we have also done is that we have, during the COVID period, tried to pursue funding to do more um, um, heritage interpretation actions together with local cultural associations. So we are trying to help the local people uh, understand and express better their heritage and find ways to, to reuse it creatively today. So we have had two actions approved by the Ministry of Culture, one of which is almost being completed now. It included also oral history recordings. And um, in uh, we have a second one here. You can see photos from the seminar of oral history. Uh, through European funding for the first time for our organization uh, this year, we were able to, to create a, an office space. You can see here on the left, our first seminar took place in January to help local producers um, communicate better uh, their products to the visitors and try to liaise them with the uh, with the with the project for the for the path. So we are trying to create a digital map now with all the producers of the island uh, related to the walking routes, so visitors can trace them and find them and seek for local products. We continue working together with uh, foreign bodies, mostly the European Ramblers Association, 
we participate in a working group for new quality certification products for short uh, walks. As I told you, we continue uh, organizing these maintenance walks with really impressive participation on a steady basis. More and more people are walking. During pandemic, we saw a lot of people walking, which is really a very positive thing that came out of such a uh, difficult situation. And to start closing my presentation, the challenges for us all these years have been the nature of the project, you know, the voluntary and non-profit character of this um, of this project, um, the lack of environmental consciousness within the local authorities and the community in general. Um, it is very difficult, it seems, for central planning to acknowledge and include efforts like ours, an organization like ours, in, in the planning. We see a lot of new uh, laws and funding opportunities that they just, you know, are interested in new projects, in new constructions, and not thinking about who is going to preserve all this uh, new infrastructure. We have constantly to struggle to cover our resources, uh, resource needs to maintain the routes and to run uh, to expenses to run our organization. And there are limited funding opportunities that do not cover these operational costs. Um, I already mentioned the landscape destruction from legal roads and wind farms that require legal actions. And this is another thing that takes a lot of energy we are just a small organization that has now to take also legal action is really a very difficult thing to handle. And of course, fatigue. Um, what we have done, you know, taking some distance from, from this small project located in, in one of the Cycladic Islands, that is, what we have done is an approach to manage a public resource by, uh, by a, a non-profit organization, locally based based on volunteering and create own earnings and fundraising. Um, it is an attempt to preserve and promote the old walking network following European standards. I, I mentioned before that the European quality certification was a very important step for us, helped us play specific goals and also uh, engage the community and gave, of course, visibility to the effort and the island. What we have done is a replicable methodology, can be copied. We are here to help and share with anybody interested in any island or in any place. People are contacting us and we are very happy to give any kind of information and support. We have pursued tourism as a means to an end uh, to help us study, preserve and creatively use heritage in a contemporary way. Yeah. Making benefits for the local community it was not tourism a goal per se, as many people think or Sometimes as we, we, we lead local people to believe because this is where people get engaged. They're interested in tourism. They are interested in making money. Um, so for us, it was mostly to preserve and, and reuse uh, and tourism was a means to, the, to this goal. Uh, it seems that there is a great need to invest in, hum in the human elements, create local cells that can safeguard heritage. This is something that we have really um, lived through this uh, through this experience of the Andros Roots project, and there seems to be a great need to creatively include the communities in the legal frameworks. And when um, people are planning from the ministries and their offices for sustainability, there is a, although everybody speaks about this, in reality, is not really is not really happening. So you can see photos here from uh, our uh, work and. Uh, excursions with the volunteers. And coming to the last um, thing on how can each and everyone help. Of course, when you're on an island, it's we, I, we would advise you to choose to walk the old walking routes. You're going to experience and see things that you will never see using a car. It's amazing. It's a, it's a completely different world that is around and next to the old walking routes. Um, you can make photos of any damages or issues and then report them to the local authorities, either a broken wall or a damage or something that is disrupting or creating problems, um, or to the local initiatives uh, to make it uh, also, or you can even make it public. This helps a lot, making public an issue that you encounter um, uh, in a, in a, while you walk in a, in a cycladic island. You can, of course, have with your garbage bag and collect any plastic you may find on route. 
Um, you can place a fallen stone on the nearby wall, even better if you can press it on the wall, so you make the wall more robust. It's, it's good and useful and can be fun also to trace local initiatives in your area related to walking and walking routes and liaise them with initiatives on an island to visit or have a second home. Um, and if residing on an island, uh, having an, an initiative, you, it would be great to join. Uh, even if, and even if there isn't one, you can you can start your own if you if you feel like it. And and we are here to to help. Uh, this is our link to a website where you can find ways to help our project. We are always looking for volunteers, not only on the ground but for management. These are our um, uh, social media contacts. Andrew's Roots on Facebook, Instagram, and our website. And I want to thank you very much. And uh, now Na uh, Nasia will play a short video from the last festival uh, we have organized. So you have a little feeling of Andrew's for the people that you don't come from Andrew's and also see how it was, this rehearsal that I told you, how it can be all year round for, uh, for villages like these to have people walking because it's something that is really is really possible. It is all needs to have people inspired, working, and, and planning. So, Nasia, thank you. Thank you, Olga. Uh, Dorothy will be sharing uh, the video. Thank you very much for the overview of all your work and history of the organization. It's always uh, amazing to see what you have accomplished, uh, even when we know it. There's always more, more to learn about things that you've done throughout the years. And it's very impressive that you also managed uh, last year with a lot of work. We know uh, it's not easy to have the certification renewed, particularly in an era that was still COVID. So um, available people to help were even less um, than you would expect in the previous years, I assume. Uh, so, Dorothy, should we go ahead with playing the video and then go to the Q&A? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Olga will go through some uh, questions that we have in the chat. And if anyone else would like to share more questions, uh, please go ahead. Um, so 
We have first a question by Mr. Powell. Will there be an Anderson Food Festival in 2023? <laughs> okay, this is a question. Everybody's asking about this, but um, look, it was it was a wonderful experience. It was very hard work for us. Um, the COVID have have has stopped us this last um, you know three years of, of organizing but also for us the the anderson food festival was like an event that is important but is not more important than the work we are doing so the priority is on the roots preservation and not in organizing another event that would take a lot of energy but at the moment we have invested in several open actions that we have to close so the answer is unfortunately we are not organizing a festival in 2023 if we are well, and if we are not so tired, and, and yes, we may consider doing this in 2024. Thank you for asking, though. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Um, then you have many congratulations also be, before that. Then someone on Tinos is asking if someone would like to volunteer in Tinos, they can go ahead and contact them, and we'll be happy okay. to know that some linking has uh, happened there. Um, so, uh, Nicoletta from Anafi saying, hello, Olga, I live all year around in Anafi, and this has been in the back of my mind for the past month, as the island has beautiful paths. I would love to connect and see where I can start from. Our community is very small, 150 inhabitants, and I already know I will need a lot of personal effort that I would love to. Thank you for sharing. It's very inspiring. So Yes, uh, by all means, you can contact uh, us, uh, Nicoletta. It will be a pleasure really to share. I mean, it's something that should grow in many other places. And I think it's, it's starting to grow also in many different ways. That would be lovely for us to, to know as I well know, if such an yeah, effort I, I know municip Municipalities are getting more involved as well. I have to say that there will be huge funding um, this coming months. That is, is not necessarily a good thing, to be, to be honest. I'm a bit worried about these enormous funds that will uh, be available to, for the municipalities to, to create um, networks because I'm afraid of what will happen. They may be cementing routes or putting lights on routes because I have heard of all these things. And the most, I don't know, worrying factor is, is that they, nobody thinks about tomorrow. You know, new projects, grand projects will take place and then who's going to preserve them? is going to be a problem i'm afraid okay sorry i have thank you olga no anything you you comment on is useful for everyone with your experience we'd, we'd rather hear you uh so uh then panagiotis uh olga you have done you have all done amazing work there like to have you around how did you creatively reduce your routes in andros do you have an example I think you showed yeah. a couple of... Uh, I of think, uh, yeah, the festival was one, but also we tried to connect with the local cultural associations and one, whatever they consider um, living heritage in their area, we tried to connect it. Like, um, we, we organize walks and then at the end of the walk, we have the local people either guiding us or cooking something for us or showing us something that they have uh, been exercising. Um, and I think the festival was a combination of all these uh, ways. Um, but also we, we try to use, we have a lot of interest from local cultural associations because they see the impact mm -hmm. of when you have a route on your area and they, they want to create, uh, to reopen routes in their area and adopt them. Um, it's like, you know, it's like a, a virtue circle this because things started happening. You have people visiting, then the local people can interact. Um, and I think giving pride to the to the local people that they have been feeling for I don't know decades that their lifestyle is on demise and is of no value anymore, I think is really a very very important intangible uh, value of this effort. Thank you. Then we have a question by Annie. Uh, yeah, Olga, uh, could you please tell us more about the challenges you have faced? with the other locals in the first place, if any, and how this yeah. has now changed as they realize the benefit for the communities and local economy. Look, in the beginning, I would say the, the, the biggest problem, the biggest problem, I mean, it was like, because we, we, we were not appointed by the local authorities or by anybody, it was like a grassroots effort. And we had to 
First, we were mapping all the routes in every area. And in the most remote villages, people were a bit, um, you know, not hostile in the beginning, but they were a bit skeptical. You know, why are we doing this? What, what are, is there any hidden agenda? They were a bit afraid. Um, and we had incidences where people were removing signs or stealing um, signposts. But we have done extended work in, in uh, communicating the you know, why. I mean, we explain to people, we try to, to work with them. And, and at the end, we, you know, the, there were cases where people have brought back the stolen signposts or, I mean, we had funny stories taking place in, in remote, mostly mountainous villages. And I think it's a big success, let's say now that we have this open work, open infrastructure that has all these signs and they are all, more or less in place. This reflects, um, I think, acceptance and recognition of the value of this project. That, for example, to give you now an example, in Imitos in Athens, they're trying to create a long distance route. I know the people. And because of course, Imitos is a mountain where all the Athenian people are walking, it's very difficult to do that. People are removing and you can never know who removed the signs and why. Um, so it, it's also, it has to do, you know, with the size of the area. And uh, yeah, this was one challenge. Another challenge, Annie, was the, it was not easy with the local authorities. Like I, there was no help and still there is really any actual help. And the challenges today is have to do with the destruction of the landscape still, although people are recognizing the value and they're benefiting. And of course, the municipality is promoting heavily the, and Andros is being now known for the walking routes. In reality, there is no real care for the landscape and its preservation. And I think at the same time, the tourism people are dreaming of becoming Mykonos, but also having the walking routes. I'm not sure they realize if these two models can go together or having cruise boats coming on Andros. So I, I think still a lot of uh, work that needs to be done. Uh, I think this is just a you know, it, it, there can be more positive results, but we need really, we need help. We need more support um, and working together with authorities as well. And I would say that we need to be liaised more with the, with the people planning, uh, planning in the regional authorities, planning in the central government authorities. There's just a, a huge gap between um, practice on the field and, and people planning and the local authorities in between. Um, yeah. Thank you, Olga. So just uh, two more questions were, uh, they're mm -hmm. both short. Uh, there are a couple more, but I think we should take them afterwards for the discussion time so that we can close up this Q&A, then have a short break and then proceed with Marios. Yes. Um, so uh, Mr. Powell asks, how much of the paths are monopathy? Uh, mm -hmm. all, all of them, I would assume, but better if you take that on. And then Philip asks, is it possible to certify the paths by the Ministry of Culture as legally protected monuments mm -hmm. rather than, okay. I assume, you mean try to protect them through the Ministry yes. of the Environment? Yes, this is, a good, this is a good question. And the asking about the monopathy depends on how you define the monopathy. If monopathy is a narrow path, because it usually, you, you, it's very narrow, then I'm not sure. All people, all people, we call them monopathia because it's something we understand, all of us. But in reality, there used to these used to be the old roads of the time before the use of the car. So some of them can be really very wide and stone paved and even have two lanes. I mean, we have huge commercial old routes that are almost up to seven meters wide. So I don't know if it's meant by monopathy exactly. It's a matter of definition. Um then about the Ministry of Culture certification, this is a this is a, something really a delicate question. We have thought about this as well because we were thinking, okay, let's try to um, uh, renounce them as as monuments, the path themselves, uh, in order to protect them. But you know something, reality has shown that destructions are taking place. The most efficient way. In, in Greece, we have all these laws that are never being enforced and never being monitored, really. And what happens is when you when you make a root uh, monument, is that you ra you raise a lot of restrictions for the um, for the properties uh, next to these roots. 
So this will probably mean that the property owners will, will, will develop a very hostile attitude um, towards the, this gesture. So if you ask me, because we were thinking as well, uh, it's like somebody's cutting you in the half. The part would say, yes, of course, this is a, a legal protection and should be and it could be. But then the other thing, the other half says, you know, but if the local people are opposing this or if they are affected by this, is this really, is this going to be efficient? We have routes that are being protected as monuments on Andros, and they have been cut by legal roads that are being opened in the night with the bless, secret blessings of some local authorities sometimes. So I'm not sure really how to answer to this, is that, is it, but it's a good question, yeah. So thank you, Olga, and we should also thank, uh, thank you. You, the rest of your team and uh, Uli that is here, and I think Yola was also yes. here, so it's lovely to- And there are people that help a lot. initiative here. Like and Barbara are, as well, yes. So yes. we are very grateful. I, yeah. Really, and I mean, please, without uh, this, yeah, without the team, without the volunteers, all of us. I'm a volunteer as well, and the support of some people that believe in what we do, we, we have, we we wouldn't have made it so far. So thank you, really, and thank you as well, because you are, you are one of these people that has supported us in many different ways from CPO. Thank you, and I would like to call to everyone who is offering to give voluntary support to reach out directly or to drop us an email with whom uh, they would like us to, to link them because sometimes things in the chat uh, can get lost. Uh, however, the questions are marked also that um, Mrs. Polychroniada would like a question in the end, but we will uh, wrap up here, take a small break until quarter past six, and then we will continue with uh, Marios and the rest of the questions for Olga, as was with the rest of the questions for Elena. We will discuss them in the end discussion after Marios. So a short break until 6.15, thank you. Representing Alcioni. Sorry, I will repeat that for the recording. Welcome back everyone. We'll continue with uh, Mr. Marios Furnaris who will talk to us about wildlife in the Cyclades. Marios is representing Alcioni, the Aegean Wildlife Hospital that is located in Paros. Alcioni is only one of the two registered and licensed wildlife hospitals in Greece. For those interested, the second official wildlife hospital in Greece is in the city of Florina, in the northwest Greece. Northwest, northwest Greece. It specializes in bears and wolves and is run by the organization Arcturus. So back in the Cyclades now. Alcioni started its operations in 1995 on the island of Paros, where around 17,000 wild animals have been treated since. Most of these animals are birds and about 60% have been successfully released into the wild. Many birds that were not able to be released, for example, due to permanent handicaps that would not allow them to fly anymore, spend the rest of their lives under the hospitable open air environment of Alcioni. Marius is the founder and director of Alcioni and has been running the Wildlife Hospital as a volunteer for 28 years now. He will tell us about its history and operations, as well as what we can do to help injured animals and who to contact if we come across one. Maria, off uh, to you, you can share your screen. Thank you very much, Nasia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Annie and Dorothy and CPF for all the support you've given us for a long time now and uh, the opportunity you uh, gave us, you offered us uh, today to speak with these nice people. Um, Aegean Wildlife Hospital is, uh, as, as uh, Nasia said, um, the, the only one, the only official, uh, the only wildlife hospital in Greece with official license um, uh, dealing with birds. And the aim of the hospital is to rehabilitate and uh, bring back to the, the wild all the wild animals uh, we receive and uh, usually have been injured or sick. That's uh, Maria, nice could you, sorry to interrupt you, could you share your screen full screen? Um... It is full screen, isn't it? 
No, not for us, unfortunately. The bottom right, uh, Sorry. the button next to 50%. Uh, is it now? Um, is it now no, full screen? To give it a second. No, it's not. Um, can you try from the three buttons at the bottom, the one we tried before, but then give it a second for us to see if it's going to show or not. Now? So. I believe you have to start the slideshow. Or just stop sharing and share it again and you adjust perhaps again the right button. It is, uh, I did it as we did before and it's, it's full and screen it's on not, me, uh, but it's not probably to you. Um, no, no, maybe uh, cut the share and reshare. Um, Do you like me to share instead? I'm not sure how it's going to be on the ah. Something is it now? No. Okay. Uh, not yet, but if you press again the presentation, it's better. But it's not what we're going for. Do you see it now, full screen? No. Why is this no? happening now? Um, should we go ahead like this, or would you like me to share? I don't know. If it worked before, but now, unfortunately, we have this issue. Uh, still no luck. Let's proceed, guys. I mean, if you don't mind, let's proceed with with. Um. It's okay, I, Maria. I Let's continue. Let's continue like this. It's okay. I, I don't I, I don't know what you you are looking at now. <laughs> anyway, it's um, good enough though. Uh, you see the the all 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 photos together, or you see one one picture? What do you look at? We see the menu at the left and your main slide, so it's it's good enough. Okay, okay then. Um, so that's a kingfisher and the treatment. And let's talk a little bit about uh, how these uh, animals uh, come to us. What we, which are the problems we face in, uh, in uh, Greece? Because we receive animals from all over the country, not just from the Kikladic Islands, mainly from, from the islands, but also from mainland. This is an historical uh, photo because this is the, the last Bonelli seagull we had on Paros. Uh, please uh, imagine that this, uh, that species of eagle have uh, been living together with humans for thousands of years. And uh, in, in the 1990, there was a, a very serious study which shows that um, Bonelli seagull eagles on, on, on the Kikladic Islands had the healthiest European population. And we managed uh, within 15 years from 1990 to 2005, almost to extinct the, that species. Uh, at the moment, uh, Bonelli's eagles exist only on Andros Island. Uh, so this is the last one we had on Paros. The kids on Paros will never see a live Bonelli's eagle again. This bird was shot, illegally shot. It uh, arrived at our hospital, remained invalid because the wing and had to be amputated. So it lived for some years with us and then it uh, died in, uh, in our hands. So uh, shooting, illegal shooting is one of the biggest problems uh, for the wildlife in uh, Kikladic, uh, Kikladis Islands. As uh, it was said before from all at some point. There are several uh, laws in Greece uh, that uh, protect the uh, environment and the wildlife, but it is very difficult for these laws to um, 
to apply uh, daily, uh, especially for, for the islands, because we don't have any control on, on these laws. So uh, people can go out and uh, shoot uh, illegally, whatever moves, and there's nobody there to, to check what they are doing. For example, on Paros, uh, we do not have any forestry employees. We have only one uh, uh, person who is a member of uh, the uh, hunting society, and uh, he he is very good at his job. Actually, he goes around and uh, check, but he, there is only one person, and he's a uh, he's he's paid by the the hunting society. There is no uh, not anybody from the state uh, from. Uh, uh, the forestry office to to, to the important uh, control on on hunting. Uh, this uh, long-legged buzzard um, is another species that have been extinct from Paros. When I came to Paros to start the wildlife hospital in uh, 1995, uh, we had several uh, pairs of long-legged buzzards on the island. This one is uh, was extremely lucky. Uh, you can see on the next photo, which is the X-ray of this uh, particular bird, uh, there are 29 shot pellets on its body. Uh, it has been shot at least uh, three times. And uh, the only problem- Maria, that, uh, sorry, because we're not actually seeing your presentation. I will share from my um, computer. And if you could please tell me which uh, slide we're- supposed to be on. Um, if I can also share full screen. And Nasia, show us please the, the, the previous slides because we haven't seen any, just the first one. And the Bonelli's Eagle would love to see it. Okay, let me go you, through you all of You didn't see that. anything so far. No, no. Just the first slide, just the first slide. But I also don't know how to do this full screen. Really sorry to everyone for this technical issue. We were unprepared for that. Okay, that's the Bonelli sigil I was talking about, the last one we had on Paros. Let's, yes, that's a photo of hunters. And that, that is the lucky one. And next, you, we, we can see the X-ray of this bird, a long-legged buzzard with 29 shot pellets on its body. That's the X-ray. The, 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 the picture is, uh, has too much, too much light, so you cannot see all the shot pellets. It was extremely lucky because the only problem that um, made this uh, bird uh, to stay on the ground was that very easy to heal fracture on radius and ulna. So that bird uh, was able to be released again. Uh, let's move to the next uh, photo, Nasia. The, the, that, on the other hand, was extremely unlucky. This long-legged buzzard, just one shot pellet went inside the right eye, uh, destroyed the eye and uh, moved uh, into the back of the brain of the bird and uh, destroyed the sense of balance of the bird. And that was the reason it remained invalid and stayed with us for the next 12 years. 
there, there's a study, a very good study that shows that the half of the buzzards and long-legged buzzards flying free in, in Greece, they have shot pellets in, in their body because uh, these are big birds and they fly very low and very quiet, very uh, slow. So they are very easy targets. One could ask, of course, uh, why do they shoot them? Is it uh, legal or not? Of course, it's not legal. It is legal to shoot uh, all birds of prey. But as I said before, it is very difficult to, to, uh, to, to, to keep the law, to control the law, as we don't have enough uh, forestry employees. Uh, next uh, picture. Uh, this is uh, another important, uh, extremely important bird for uh, Greece, uh, the Eleonorus falcon. Uh, the Eleonorus falcon is the rarest falcon on earth. The world, worldwide population is only 4,000 pairs, but uh, the 70% of uh, the world population from April to October is on the Aegean Sea. They come uh, from the beginning of April until the mid of October uh, to the Aegean uh, Islands in order to stay here for the, for the summer and uh, to nest uh, here. And then they go back in the, uh, to winter, uh, to spend the winter in Madagascar. Um, the problem is that uh, Eleonora's falcon do not nest in the springtime when the hunting season is stopped. Uh, they, uh, all through uh, the year they eat on insects, they feed on insects, but when they have babies on their uh, uh, nests, they need small birds. So uh, they, feed, they nest uh, late uh, summer. They, they start their nests in, uh, at the end of uh, uh, August. Uh, and they have their babies on nests on uh, September in order to find uh, small birds from uh, the autumn uh, migration uh, to feed their babies on nests. Uh, the hunting season, though, uh, opens in, uh, in Greece, starts uh, every year at the 20th, 20th of August. And that's very weird because it's in the, the mid of uh, uh, the touristic season. And uh, at the peak of the touristic season, we have thousands of uh, people with arms uh, going outside, uh, outside in uh, nature and shoot. Anyway, that's another thing. But uh, it's, uh, it's fatal for the species, for the uh, Lenora's falcon, which is, as I said before, uh, the rarest uh, falcon on Earth. Uh, next photo. That's a release of um, an Eleonora's falcon many years back in, on, on Paros with uh, Stephen Harris. Stephen Harris is um, uh, one famous mammalologist, uh, professor on, on Bristol. Next photo. That's the trip of the Eleonora's falcon from uh, the Aegean Sea to uh, Madagascar for wintering. Uh, you can see the, the long route of uh, four birds. Um, it's, uh, if I remember well, it's something like uh, 28,000 kilometers, the, the whole route. Another release of uh, two Eleonoras and one uh, Kestrel on Paros. That's, a, that's an osprey, another bird we don't have uh, anymore on, uh, on the Kiklades and the whole country. Uh, the last osprey uh, nested on, uh, in, in Greece, in northern Greece, back in the 60s. Uh, the fishermen uh, believed uh, that was bad for their profession because uh, this bird is uh, feeding on fish. So they hunted, hunted down uh, that species and uh, now we do not have any ospreys nesting in Greece. They only pass through the country uh, during their migration. This bird was found on um, Ioannina uh, by uh, 1999, uh, uh, if I remember well. Uh, it was very badly shot. You see the photo the moment it was found. Uh, it was amputated and uh, died a year later in our hospital. Next photo. 
So uh, on top of uh, hunting, there is a new uh, mode, let's say, uh, falconry, which is something common in the uh, UK. It was illegal in Greece for the last 200 years. Unfortunately, uh, it's not illegal anymore. Since uh, tw uh, 2020, uh, there is a new law and falconry is uh, legal now in Greece. And um, uh, that's a, a huge problem for, for Greece because it, if it is difficult to control the laws of hunting, imagine how difficult it will be to control uh, the falconers, which are going outside with all these uh, uh, trained uh, birds of prey, or even the hybrids, which are uh, huge killers, you know, and they just kill everything. Uh, th then they, they cannot even control uh, which animals they are going to be dead. They, they just kill whatever moves. Next photo. Another species that have been uh, extinct from uh, Paros uh, is uh, the Alduin's gull. Uh, these uh, were very rare gulls uh, living in the Aegean. Um, we had uh, two uh, back in the 90s. We had very, two very small um, uh, communities of uh, Alduin's gulls, um, one between Paros and uh, Adiparos, and one between Paros and Naxos. They they do not exist anymore. Uh, they get a, a, a very big pressure by the uh, herring gulls, which are huge in numbers. Only around Paros, we have something like 5,000 pairs of herring gulls. So uh, the Alduin's gulls, uh, they get less and less in the uh, GNC. Uh, it is also um, uh, some good news we have from Spain because they are getting better in Spain. Next photo. Apart from um, uh, the big birds, which are, uh, the, the, you know, the, the birds of prey, or the big birds that are getting less and less uh, in um, uh, the Greek nature. Um, there's another big problem, the small uh, size of birds, which should be uh, around in uh, big numbers. These are getting less and less, the numbers. Uh, for example, that uh, goldfinch, uh, the, Earlier years, we would see uh, waves of uh, goldfinches uh, flying around in, in thousands. And now we can only see one here and one there. There are many ways, uh, many reasons why the small birds are, uh, the small migratory birds are getting less and less. Uh, one, for example, is uh, one reason is uh, the illegal capturing of these birds. The, that's, that's a nasty habit that started in Hios and um, through uh, migration of uh, people from Hios came to Clades, mainly on Syros uh, and uh, Santorini. Uh, and they, uh, they capture thousands of uh, small birds and uh, the hobby is just to cast them and kill them. They don't do anything with them. They don't keep them in, in uh, cages, at, at least. They, they just uh, put them in big uh, rubbish bags and throw them to the rubbish. It's, it's really a very sad story, uh, illegal, of course, but very difficult to deal with. Next photo, please. Uh, and another picture from, from a wetland. Uh, on Naxos. Uh, wetlands are extremely important for us humans, for the protection of uh, the drinking water, but uh, they are extremely important even more to birds. Imagine that now, uh, at, that, uh, at that time, uh, birds start to, the migration birds start to move from central, uh, the south and central Africa, and they have to uh, go through uh, the Sahara Desert, and then they have to fly over the Mediterranean Sea 
where they cannot, in the Sahara, they cannot find food, but they can stop somewhere and, and have some rest. In the Mediterranean Sea, they cannot stop even. So they come to uh, Crete and then from uh, one uh, Cycladic island to, to another, and uh, they need to find some food and water in order to continue that trip. But the small wetlands, which have been here for hundreds of years, and they knew they are on the way, uh, they either they get smaller and smaller or they, uh, they, they stop, stop existing uh, at all because we, we uh, need the, that uh, space for our touristic um, uh, purposes and uh, in order to build new houses and build new hotels. So the, the birds do not find any place for, in order to drink some water and, uh, and have some food. And they die from exhaustion. Millions of birds die from exhaustion, uh, migratory birds. Uh, every year in, we, we find them uh, either uh, just before they die or, uh, or we find them dead. Um, and that's, that's a, a huge problem uh, we face in Kitladas. Next uh, photo, please. That's uh, a dead uh, little egret on a wetland. Another problem, the, the way we drive with our cars and uh, often deliberately uh, people uh, uh, run over the hedgehogs and other animals, even uh, uh, pets, cats and dogs. Um, that's a, that's a hedgehog uh, under treatment. He was one of the lucky ones who survived. Next photo. Uh, snakes, snakes uh, on uh, Kiklades. Uh, uh, people are very afraid of. They, they think uh, all of them are poisonous and a uh, big danger for humans. In reality, uh, we, ha we have very many different uh, species of snakes. In Greece, we have 25 different species of snakes on which only the four of the five vipers uh, can be dangerous for humans. Um, of course, even the vipers, we do have vipers on the Cycladic Islands, but even the vipers are mu much more afraid than uh, humans. Uh, than, than we are, so they, they try to hide from us. But as we um, do not uh, allow them, we, don't, we do not uh, give them a space to live as we build everywhere, it is possible that usually our pets will meet a viper or uh, we can step on a snake early in the morning or late in the night, uh, but usually, um, uh, it's just a fear. Uh, it's, uh, we know that we do not even have one death in Greece from a viper a bite for, I don't know how, may, maybe the last uh, 30 or 40 years. But um, of course, uh, people are very much afraid and they, they kill every snake they, they meet usually. Next photo, please. Another very big environmental problem is our pets, because uh, usually we allow our dogs and cats to go free in nature. Uh, and we speak about millions of cats and uh, thousands of dogs uh, in the Greek environment. And especially the cats, they just kill everything for, for uh for fun, you know, they, they don't even eat the, the birds and the uh, reptiles and the small mammals they, they kill. Uh, it's a big problem because uh, these are pets, they are not part of the wildlife. So they go everywhere together with humans. It's part of the human environment. And they should be under control. Uh, on the next uh, picture, we can see uh, that uh, that is a study in the States, and we see how many mil billions of birds, uh, it's, it's 1,768,000,000 of birds 
killed every year compared to other uh, reasons, other problems from stray cats. And if that happens in the states where stray cats are just a very, very small percentage to the ones we have in Greece, imagine what is happening to the Greek environment. Next photo, please. A hair, a uh, baby hair we had under treatment. Next one. A uh, baby butt on Paros under treatment. A baby uh, tortoise just born. That's a release of um, uh, Sparahawk from Annie on uh, our hospital. Next photo. That's a golden eagle under treatment on uh, the Gian Wallet Hospital. That's the griffon vulture was found on um, uh, Santorini in the sea. That's a, a, a new pro problem that is coming bigger and bigger every year. The birds of prey uh, in the summer, they get so hot that uh, they are so desperate for water that they jump into the sea in order to drink water. And uh, they can, they can uh, stay in the top of the sea. They can swim for, for a few minutes. If nobody finds them, they get drowned. They cannot stay for, for long on the sea. So this, this was found by a small boat. It was rescued by the boat and sent uh, to us. And on the next picture, we see the release of this bird in, uh, on Naxos Island. That's a black kite in our hospital. That's the group of our flamingos. These are uh, invalid flamingos um, in, uh, um, in our hospital. Uh, we decided from the beginning of the existence of the hospital that uh, we will not uh, put down the invalid uh, birds and we will uh, try to keep them in uh, the most uh, uh, big and quiet conditions uh, we can for the rest of their lives. Uh, th from the group of our flamingos, uh, last year we, uh, we had uh, two babies. And we hope we'll have more in the future as they started the nesting for the first time after 28 years. That's a scops owl, one of the smallest uh, in size species of owls we have in Greece. And that's the biggest owl in the world, the bubo bubo, uh, the eagle owl, uh, which we, we have. Um, uh, very rarely, but they, they do exist in Kikladas. Uh, and this is one of these beautiful, huge birds. So this is uh, how, we, uh, how we found um, the place um, that was the building in uh, 1997. Uh, it belonged to a monastery on Paros and we rented it. And we started uh, receiving volunteers from all over the world, young people, and uh, they would camp outside and we, we uh, built it for five years in the beginning. And of course, we never stopped uh, doing more and more work uh, in the hospital. That's from the beginning of the work at the building. That's the house. Um, the, the building uh, as it was uh, almost uh, finished. You can see the premises for the volunteers on the right and uh, the um, facilities for uh, the treatment on, on, the, on the left. That's our environmental education hall where schools are coming. Every week we have uh, one, two or three schools coming at the hospital and uh, some other times we, we visit the schools. And we try to have a release um, with the uh, children because the other thing is that they, they want to see birds, but we are not a zoo. Uh, we are a hospital and it is, it, it is not possible for the visitors 
and the children to go and visit the, the uh, birds we have under treatment because they would just die from stress. So we have, we need to show them something and usually we try to have a release together with the children. That's a picture from uh, starting to build the, the aviaries outside. Um, actually, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time, but I want to tell you about this guy. When we started making the fence around uh, uh, the hospital, we didn't know exactly how to do it. And uh, it was just a group of five volunteers who we've been working for months. Uh, doing something very stupid in order to build the fence. And this guy arrived one day after, after three months we've been working and he said, uh, is there a reason why you do it this way or you just don't know how you do it? You, you, should, you should do it properly. And we said, probably we don't know. Do you have another suggestion? And he said, okay, please stop what you do and I'll come to tomorrow and we continue together. So the next day within two hours, we did what we have done until then for, for three months of working anyway. And uh, he kept coming and helping us uh, for, for all the jobs we did uh, at the hospital and he never took any money. So this uh, now the one, one group of our, um, uh, in the previous photo, um, Avery's, um, uh, we finished the skeleton and then we have to build every, uh, aviary on a different size uh, according to the size of birds it's going to host in the future. So in the next photo we see a photo from uh, from the air of uh, our facilities. You see the the building uh, up um, upright and a group of aviaries are lower down uh, with the green color. There is a new, um, you will see on the next photo, some uh, new aviaries which, uh, next to, which are next to it. And uh, please go back on the previous uh, photo. So uh, there, are, there, there is a, a big uh, fence uh, for, for the water birds. There's another big fence for the uh, black vultures. There is another group of aviaries on the left. And there is our stable because um, we always had the only exception we would do on uh, domestic animals was on uh, donkeys. Uh, because for many, many years on Paros, there was nobody else that could host the donkeys. Uh, thankfully, uh, the, the last uh, two years, we have a new project for farm animals. So the donkeys go there. We still have one donkey in our premises and that's the stable on, on the top down for our donkeys. So next picture, please. Ah, that, these are the, uh, the last uh, two big aviaries we did uh, last, uh, last year with the help of uh, Stavros Nyarkos Foundation, which are helping us very much. Um, one uh, of our biggest uh, works is uh, the environmental education together with schools. Uh, they either, schools either, as I said before, visit the hospital or we go to the, we visit the schools. And that's a release of a peregrine falcon with uh, one of the schools on Paris. So what, what shall we do if we find an, uh, an injured bird uh, uh, out uh, as, as we walk, as we, go for, for a swim or whatever. Uh, the first thing is the, that we, we need to uh, guide uh, the bird to go to a dead end, like a wall uh, or a corner, even better. And uh, we mobilize it by throwing a, a big cloth, uh, like a jacket, let's say, over the bird. So we protect ourselves from, from the bite of uh, biting the of the bird and uh, the claws. Uh, the, uh, the second thing we must do is to find a, a cardboard box. Cardboard boxes are um, ideal in order to um, 
transport uh, the wildlife because they are soft. So whatever problems they have, they cannot uh, make them worse by hitting the sides of the cardboard box. Um, and uh, by closing the, the, the top of the box, we can keep it in darkness and that helps in order to minimize the stress because that's the, the biggest problem we have with uh, wild animals. They die uh, from stress before they die from any other problem they have. So uh, we have to uh, move the bird in a quiet place uh, inside uh, our house in a warm and quiet place. And then uh, we need to communicate uh, to form the wild, any wildlife hospital in order to get, to get uh, more um, a guide and help how to uh, uh, send it, transport it uh, to more specific uh, care. That's another release of a little egret in uh, Colubithres on Paros. Uh, that's another beautiful release of um, an Eleonora's Falcon from an Ukrainian uh, volunteer who comes often, this lady. And we hope she's uh, well now. And I think that's the last one, uh, release of uh, little owls on, uh, on Paros, on top of a hill on Paros. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very it was, much. Uh, very, very interesting. And uh, once again, we're very impressed with the work that uh, you're all doing on the field. Um, we're going to play a short uh, video for Al Kioni. Uh, Dorothy will be sharing that. And because it is seven, uh, we will continue after the video with the Q&A of Marius and then go back to questions that were not answered from Elena's and Olga's uh, presentation and go through a discussion. But in case anyone uh, needs to go off because it's 7 p.m. already, we would like to thank you. We really hope that everyone will stay for the discussion in the Q&A. But just in case, know that you will receive a follow-up email by Dorothy in the next few days with uh, notes from today's presentations. But hope to have everyone with us after we see the video. Thank you. Nearly every day, birds arrive at the hospital from all over Greece. These birds are not only at the mercy of their environment, but also the humans that inhabit it. There are many threats. Uh, most of them uh, have to do with uh, the human activities. The small wetlands we destroy in order to use the land for uh, uh, touristic reasons. So migratory birds uh, do not find a place to have some uh, food and water uh, through their trip and they die uh, from exhaustion. Uh, we have a huge problem with illegal hunting in Greece and they, shoot, they just shoot everything. Uh, so we find very many extremely rare and protected birds uh, shot. We have problem with electric wires, problems with the car accidents. There is a big problem with uh, stray cats and dogs in Greece, uh, which uh, are going around and kill everything. We, we have a, a non-ending war through uh, nature, and I am afraid this war is going to uh, end with uh, nature becoming more and more uh, poor. It takes time, patience, and sometimes a lot of care for an injured animal to heal, especially with an end goal of release back into the wild. When birds cannot recover, they become permanent residents of the hospital where they can live out the rest of their lives. I would say that uh, our biggest accomplishment that we managed to keep uh, the wildlife hospital running and healthy it's not an easy thing at all. You have to fight a, a big war to cover the financial needs of the hospital and to convince the community that it is necessary a wildlife hospital to exist. Marios has dedicated the better part of three decades of his life to the hospital, but during that time he has yet to find his successor. 
I'm asking this question to myself, why do I do it for, for 30 years now? <laughs> I, I don't know the, the exact uh, answer, and I, I don't know if the answer I'm telling to myself is true. I believe I enjoy the beauty of uh, the animals we have here. I enjoyed it very much, uh, having uh, the sight of this beauty every day. I enjoy them having a second chance in life. We have hundreds of volunteers here, but through the 27 years of the hospital existence, we didn't find until now somebody who wants to, to share the total responsibility. So we, uh, we say this out loud, anybody who wants to uh, share the, the responsibility of the hospital and continue our work is very welcome to come and work with us. Thank you. We will share the full video, uh, two of the three videos that we shared. We only showed you a shorter part because they're quite long, but we will share in the presentation notes uh, the whole the link so you can watch all of them. So Maria, I will read some of the questions in the chat for you. Um, Stella, uh, hi Stella, asked, uh, thank you before, and she asked, apart from hunting and loss of habitat, how much cats impact wildlife on the Cyclades? I think it's uh, already answered. I don't know if you want to make any other uh, comment on it. No, no, I think it was said uh, twice also in the video. Okay, then um, Olga, uh, amazing work and such devotion. Do you feel there is hope for birds in the Cyclades and in Greece in general? Which are the most important threats? What are the consequences of the extinction of the species you showed us? Well, I, I don't think there is hope, uh, but, but we, we won't stop uh, do what we are doing. Um, we will fight until the end, but if I have to be realistic and uh, I'm, not say, selling, I'm not saying lies to myself and uh, uh, to other people, I do not think there is hope. Uh, um, uh, if something is uh, going according one direction for 30 years, it's very difficult to stop and go to the totally different direction. So the, uh, the, the environment, the, the wildlife uh, in, uh, on the Cycladic Islands, uh, not only on Paros, all the Cycladic Islands, and I'm afraid in, in Greece in general, is getting rapidly more poor year after year. There are very many reasons for that. It's not just hunting, it's, it's not just uh, the cars, it's not just the uh, electric wires. There, there's a uh, very, 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 it's a big discussion and many reasons for, for doing this. It's the, the way we humans have decided to live away from uh, nature uh, in um, in a uh, matrix way, let's say. Um, I, I, I would tell you this, I'm not religious, but if as an, as an example, as a symbol, if I want to use the words um, uh, paradise and hell, um, the way we have decided to live is like we go straight to hell. I mean, we, we have decided to be alone in the planet. Uh, if, we, if we don't want to be alone, some people want to have a pet or two, but not, not uh, the environment re really. Um, and that, that is the hell for me. Uh, the paradise is to, to live on, a, on an, an environment which is rich. It's not just humans. It's, uh, it is beautiful with birds and uh, trees and uh, other animals and uh, reptiles and insects. And that's, that's the paradise. But we, well, we are running away from this. Thank you, Maya. There's a comment about snakes that I'm going to read out and a question about the wind turbines. So Mr. Powell says, thank you for helping people understand how good snakes are for the islands. 
They're wonderful in their help in farming. My family of farmers always were happy for snakes. So if you have any comment on this, Maria, please let us know. And Mr. Graham uh, says, bravo, doing an amazing job. And he also has a question. How concerned are you about the plans to build multiple wind turbines on the islands? Uh, yes, that's, that's a big fight. We give um, all, the, all the island together is uh, against that uh, new project uh, because it's totally out of logic. Uh, we believe we are in a good um, um, in a good route. Maybe we will uh, win this uh, war. We hope so. Um, it's it's a big problem because the the if we speak about a small um, uh, park uh, wind park with uh, a few uh, turbines, uh, that could be a good thing. I mean, uh, who does not want uh, alternative uh, alternative uh, energy? Uh, but uh, the the plans for the Kikladic Islands and for Paros are uh, crazy with huge numbers of huge in size turbines which are going to distract and uh, destroy the, uh, the, the view and uh, the environment of, of the islands. Thank you, Maria. Then a question by Annie. Mari, how can you manage to cover everyday needs for food and medicines for the animals? Any need for support? And she also has another comment previously that donations in kind might be sometimes equally important with donations in cash. And we encourage them as CPF for all uh, local entities. But let us know for Alkion specifically, because you have a lot of uh, running costs as we know ourselves as well. Thank you very much, Annie. That's, that's our biggest uh, fear and uh, our biggest uh, fight in order to cover <coughs> our um, running costs uh, day by day for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, please uh, think that uh, the, the wildlife hospital has, has a, is, is, is something, a, a big difficulty. We have to be there every day. We, we do not have a break. It's not like a, some other projects, which are wonderful, but you can work for full time for, let's say, two months, three months, and then you recover a little bit from this work, and then you uh, go together again and work for, for the next six months or so. Uh, on, on the wildlife hospital, because at any time, we have at least 300 animals to, to, to care every day. We have to be there every day for them. And of course, we have to, to spend, uh, we have to have the funds in order to feed them. Uh, we do not have any, um, uh, any money to, 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 to pay the people because we are all uh, volunteers. But uh, our running costs are huge. And uh, we, of course, we ask for help from everybody who can help. But even more than that, even more than uh, the financial uh, uh, needs, uh, we ask for human help. Uh, as it was said in the video, we, we ask uh, anybody who can to come and uh, work with us either for a short time or for a longer time that would be even better because um, that's that's a big problem we uh, we are tired after 30 years of being there and uh, we don't see the, there are people to continue this work thank you maria it is really important to stress that these initiatives, uh, it's kind of a miracle that they, <laughs> they are existing and with so much uh, uh, organization and uh, personal effort by the people that are involved are still uh, ongoing. So none of us should take them for granted and we should try to support anyhow we can each of us. So Nina says, I have two questions. First one, on what grounds was hunting with falcons allowed again? And second one, 
If the invalid flamingo should reproduce, is it possible to release the young birds back to the wild or do they all stay in the enclosure because the young birds stay with their parents? I will start from the second one. It's a, it's a, it's a, nice, um, it's a nice story. Um, the, the flamingos are very socialized birds. Uh, many years back, we had a we had a baby flamingo which was found uh, very sick and exhausted and uh, came to us. So next spring, we dis we thought it was ready to fly away, and we we took it and uh, uh, traveled in uh, North Greece in a big lake with th thousands of uh, flamingos, and we released it there. But it stayed sad and quiet at the edge of the lake and it wouldn't go near the other flamingos. So we, we followed it for a week and it was on the same spot for a week. So finally, I, I went in the lake, just grabbed it. It, it didn't move. It stayed uh, with me. to live on, on its own. So it flew around Paros for two weeks and then it left, it uh, migrated with another group of flamingos. So they, uh, they are very, very um, close to the family, the flamingos, and uh, the babies, they leave the hospital, but they leave on their time. We, we do not decide when they have to leave. They, uh, the, the premises we have the flamingos is open from, from the day, it's not closed because all the others are um, invalid and they, can, they cannot fly out. But the babies, when they're ready, after a long time of being with their pa parents, uh, they leave the hospital and uh, they continue their lives as uh, wild birds. So for, for the first question about uh, falconry, if I, I remember well, um, it's, that's a very sad story. Um, the falconers in Greece are very active. Uh, and they, they have a lot of money because they have connections with uh, the Arabs. And they managed to convince the state that this activity should be legal. And uh, it's two years now. Um, it's not just, it, it's, a, it's a very big thing. Recently, we had the story with um, uh, this huge eagle uh, flying uh, on a uh, on uh, the football um, club Ike uh, in the beginning of every football uh, game. Uh, it, it was a so sad and um, horrible icon of the poor bird flying with a, a football uh, uh, a ball uh, tied up on, on, on its uh, legs uh, and doing, doing some, uh, you know, humiliating uh, movements around. Uh, th this, uh, this show has stopped now. We have been to the Greek court against uh, the show. The, um, uh, the court case is not done yet. It's not finished yet, but the show has been finished because there was an argument between the, the owner of the club and uh, the falconer. But uh, the, the problems with uh, the falconers in Greece, uh, I believe, um, will go on and on for many years, and they, the, the situation is going to, to be much worse than it is now. Thank you, Maria. Um, I think we are done with uh, the questions that were directly asked uh, to you. So before we go back to the questions that were previously asked for Elena and Olga and anything in between that uh, would be coming and have a discussion, we would like everyone to know, for those of you that uh, speak Greek or are Greek or have a circle with Greeks or Greek speaking people, that Marius will be giving another uh, seminar on Wednesday in Greek at 5 p.m. this coming Wednesday to discuss um, again the wildlife in the Cyclades and the organization of, uh, of a network of first aid um, stations uh, so that the Cyclades can support locally and uh, make sure that all injured uh, wildlife uh, goes to the hospital in Paros uh, on time. 
So we will be sharing a press release uh, tomorrow, most probably. It should be in the news tomorrow and on Wednesday morning. And, and it is already on our Facebook page. Uh, registration is required, but you're all invited to share with your, um, with your networks of uh, Greeks and Greek-speaking people. So um, let's go back to the questions that we had at the beginning for Elena. Um, so we had this question about grazing that was already answered uh, and initiatives to reduce over grazing, but a few follow-up questions came from that one. Uh, Olga commented that the legislation exists on managing animal grazing. The problem is that it is not being enforced. And then Mark uh, commented that there is an interesting grazing solution from Norway called No Fence, limiting, gra limiting grazing of the animals to a certain area without fences, however, probably too expensive for the average Greek farmer. I don't know, Evelyn, Ellen, if you've heard of it, it's not clear exactly what it is. And then uh, Tafi Vakri, um, she asked, what measures can help to ensure that livestock farming is sustainable and does not have negative impact on the environment. What about rotational grazing, paddocks or pastures? Exactly, one of the most imp important ways to uh, to turn grazing even to be beneficial for uh, for the soil and for the land is rotational grazing. There are, as Olga said, and as we keep saying, uh, the whole issue is about reg uh, regulation and legislation. Uh, there is a body in Greece that uh, gives recipes of rotational pasture, talks about uh, the carrying capacity of the landscape according to the climate and to the place. And uh, rotational grazing, grazing has been known for forever. Uh, but we, you just need the necessary resources to go down to the, to the people that the, the pastors, the um, uh, people that are involved with animal rearing and inform them, educate them, and they will eventually follow this because more and more in Greece and in all over Europe, actually, and all over the world in the end, are very much pressured by the uh, rising prices of fodder, of animal food, and of rising prices of their whole enterprise. It, it will become unprofitable. It's certainly unprofitable in the cyclades. The only thing that kind of saves us in a way is that there are fewer and fewer people involved. And I'm, I'm not saying that the solution is just to stop grazing altogether. There, there can be a beneficial effect of grazing, in a, but th there are sustainable ways to go about it. And it's like the answer to most of the questions is legislation. If we followed the laws, we would have uh, much fewer problems than we have in all aspects of uh, home environmental management, actually. I hope Thank I you, Elena. Well, if someone needs uh, clarifications or more, they can uh, write in the chat. And we also welcome everyone. Uh, to please raise your hand or open your screen and raise literally your hand. <laughs> Otherwise, it's in the reactions uh, and then uh, you press reactions and then you press raise hand. Uh, we had such a situation before my Mrs. Polychroniadou. Uh, if you're still with us, yes, please. Um, Oh, we cannot uh, hear you. The sound is uh, distorted. Maybe if you can, unfortunately, if you can write it in the chat, then we can, uh, even if you write in the chat in Greek, we can translate for everyone. Okay, that was unfortunate. Um, yeah, try, try the chat maybe, and we will do our best to to answer. So anyone else that would like to take uh, the floor? Um, Vicky, Vicky asks a question about fencing, which electric fencing, fencing, which is very interesting, if I may. Okay, can you also repeat the question and then answer it? Yes. Uh, hello, Vicky. Uh, Animal Action Greece uh, have an initiative regarding electric fencing. Uh, and this can be, uh, can be interesting for the cyclists, but um, 
in general for grazing. Uh, I think it's the way to go. Uh, there are some technical issues in, uh, in the Cycladis because we have very dry climate. I have, uh, I have followed the, the seminars of Animal Action Greece in Paros and the people um, that gave the seminar were quite perplexed about how to apply it properly. And they were also quite, um, how to say, um, surprised that our goats have still their horns because in England they don't have their horns anymore. So they don't risk uh, getting uh, mixed in the wires of the electric fencing. So there are some technical issues, but I'm sure that uh, these could be solved. But even um, grazing with a pastor, with a pastoral, with a, uh, now the, the word escapes me, me vosko, epitirumeni voskisi, the managed grazing, when you have people actually leading the animals here and there where they need to, to go uh, to uh, graze, this could work as well. And this is how it was happening in the past. Uh, you didn't have the animals just free going everywhere um, or you had, but this could also work, but it needs, uh, it needs people to be done. Thank you, Elena. Uh, would you like to try again, uh, Ms. Polifonev? Let's see. Yes. Is it better now? Yes, we can hear you. That's great. Thank Sorry, you. my microphone. Anyway, I'm here thanks to Dorothy, whom I've known before she was born. And uh, I thank you so much for this wonderful uh, webinar. I actually am from Angus uh, originally from my maternal side and uh, this Andros roots has been bugging me. I mean, the idea is wonderful. And my grandfather actually did it for living. He had to walk all the way from Corthy to Hora because they were building things there. And uh, uh, then he immigrated to America. I think it wasn't very profitable anyway. It's a wonderful thing to do if anyone uh, to make it like fashion to be to be there. And I, as a child, I walked all over the place because I loved it. Panagia Tromarchia everywhere, and uh, you know, it's it's wonderful. So thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much as well. Um, there was a comment before by Vicky again that I guess uh, you're cl uh, close to Elena, but it was for, for uh, all if there would be some uh, intra and exchange visits and all was also very positive about that. We're also very positive about that as CPF, so we would love to see how we can support something like that. You know, Olga, it's one of our our goals. Um, so we we try to target different uh, activities to different. Um, audiences but uh everything uh, is connected so <laughs> we'd love to to help uh scale up these initiatives and see uh um different uh, roots initiatives support each other and andros would be the perfect uh, example of a local initiative that could support other um it could be lovely efforts. Nastia to also visit one another like you know the one initiative the initiatives from different islands to visit an initiative in another island because for example i i learned a lot of fantastic things today from elena what is happening in paros that i didn't know and from marios as well i'm really impressed and very much interested because we don't have these things uh, on andros for example and it would be lovely to have the chance as well to cross exchange i don't know somehow Yes, we, we have to find a way. It was a real uh, pity that you couldn't make it to the to the forum. Uh, we visited the Paris Park and Alkyoni Hospital. Marius was not there, but uh, we were hosted by another volunteer. And it's very impressive. So we'll try to find yeah. another opportunity to, to do that. Yeah, and if you allow me, I think what Marius also mentioned about, you know, continuing, this is one of the biggest problems as well that is also troubling me personally. And I think this is an advanced problem. Let's say if, if a project is mature, then 
you know, there must be some kind of succession. So this is an issue as well that is rarely being addressed because rarely an effort lasts for long, probably. Um, so, I mean, at an early stage of, of an effort is, is like to make it survive and, and make it bring results. And then at a later stage, the idea is how can you continue doing this because people have to move on or they can't continue anymore or they're tired, they need a break or whatever. So this could be another topic for uh, for you ladies at the CPF that you do all these fantastic things to think about, I mean, to help somehow, I don't know. Yeah, thank you, or to Olga. exchange, this... or to exchange between us. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, it is uh, among the things that are of a high concern for us as well, uh, that uh, initiatives are, are so much based on the personal drive of some very, very uh, significant people and very active people and outsiders that maybe there's an, something very, like a lot of people working behind, but in fact, it's small teams that drive it. And if you're lucky, you have a lot of other people supporting, but it's not everyone driving an initiative forward or helping it maintain small groups of people. And this is of a, of a big concern for us as well. And it's something we've been uh, trying to consider and see how we can, we can tackle it. So we are uh, approaching, we're already 25 pa minutes past. So if there are any questions that have not been answered, we would love if you could please share them to us by an email so we can forward to the, to the presenter that did their presentation. And I think we should uh, be closing off. Uh, we would like uh, to let you know, there was also a question in the chat, there will be follow-up notes uh, to everyone who was registered in the webinar about what was presented. And at a later time, we will upload uh, a recording from today and they will be available on demand for anyone to view. Uh, so this information will remain uh, online and available for others to view as well. I don't know if Annie, you have any final remarks. Uh, I would like to thank everyone, our presenters, Dorothy, Annie, everyone who participated, uh, everyone who we see there and everyone who we don't see. Um, and uh, Annie, you have anything else to share? Or no, the, 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 usual, Maria, the usual encouragement, you know, to everyone, except from thanking you all. You know, it's, 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 it was an amazing group, an amazing discussion. Thank you. A big thank you to Mario, Elena, Olga, my lovely colleagues, Nasia and Dorothy. We are really grateful. You are the power, you know, really the people are the power. These local heroes are our inspiration. So the usual encouragement, please feel, find ways to support them, you know. Uh, either it's a small or a bigger donation, spread the word about their work, um, donations in kind, offer hands, offer time. This is the best we can do to even morally, you know, like give these people, you know, like some of the uh, congratulations that they deserve. Uh, we are grateful for their work and we're grateful uh, to you for staying with us all these three and a half hours. Uh, <laughs> uh, but please stay with us. There are more here to, to come from our small team. And we thank you again um, for being so generous. Open your microphones now to say good night. It will be lovely to hear your voices. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the thank you for the organization. You were marvelous. Thank you so much, everyone, for your amazing work. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, Good night. Thank you so much. Hello, Bradley. What are you doing? Yes. yes. Hello, Bradley. Hi. You also say in me. Yes, say good night. Kalinita. 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 Hi, Tina. It's a toilet, though. Tina, Len. This is the best part, I think. <laughs> Very spontaneously. Thank you. No, I think we were great. Thank you very much for your organization. Also, it so went very smoothly. Fantastic.
If you are happy, we are happy. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Thank you. Ευχαριστούμε. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Ευχαριστούμε και εμεί. Και την Όλγα, ευχαριστούμε. Είσαστε καλά. Έχω κάνει όλου έξω και άφησα μόνο την άξονα. Ωραία, ωραία. Αυτό είναι η δική μα. Ποιο είναι, ο Γιάννη, η Σοφία, ανοίξτε την κάμερα. Ανοίξτε κανένα μια κάμερα, ρε παιδιά, εδώ είναι άξο. Οι γειτονέ εδώ. Αν είναι η Σοφία, να ανοίξει. Αν είναι ο Γιάννη, όχι. Μπορεί να μην είναι πια μπροστά εκεί. Ο Αχηλέα, ο Αχηλέα είναι. Ο Αχηλέα, συγχαρητήρια σε όλου σα. Κλείνω εδώ από το δεύτερο λάπτο. Είσαστε εντάξει, είπατε Είστε όσα θέλατε να πείτε. Όλοι. Νομίζω εντάξει. ότι υπήρχαν τόσα πολλά κι άλλα. Αλλά εύχομαι να είπαμε όλα όσα θέλαμε οπωσδήποτε να πούμε. Δηλαδή, στι σημειώσει μου έχω άλλα 4-5 για τον καθένα σα, αλλά δεν γίνεται. Είπαμε αρκετά, νομίζω. Δηλαδή, εγώ ε, το ευχαριστήθηκα από τα. Είπαμε. Ναι, νομίζω παρά, παρά είπα. Εγώ το αισθάνομαι ότι παρά είπα κιόλα, αλλά εντάξει. Όχι, Άρα, καλή, τι παρά είπε. σα ίσα, μια χαρά. Και μην ανησυχείτε, θα προσπαθήσουμε χαρά, να μοντάρουμε και τα, δηλαδή για το βίντεο και τα λοιπά, ότι είναι εκεί η Μάρια, συγγνώμη για το όλο πρόβλημα, το τεχνικό, θα προσπαθήσουμε κάποιο να το βάλουμε ώστε να βγάζει δεν, ένα... Δεν ξέρω γιατί έγινε αυτό, γιατί όταν ξεκινήσαμε δούλεψε καλά και μετά έκανα ακριβώ mm. τις ίδιες κινήσεις, δεν ξέρω γιατί δεν μπορούσε να... Δεν πειράζει, δεν συμβαίνουν πάνω, δεν αυτά. Πειράζει. Και εμένα το σέρν yeah. ήταν έγκεντρο, δεν ξέρω αν το βλέπατε εσείς. Εγώ που έβλεπα. Τι, βλέπ... Άσφα, τι βλέπετε εσείς και τι βλέπω εγώ, άλλο έβλεπα εγώ εσείς, αλλά τόσο πάντων φαινόντουσαν, οπότε εντάξει. Ωραία, το Zoom, όλο το recording, α, το οποίο πρέπει να το σταματήσω, by the way. Ακόμη κάνεις recording, το... για σταμάτω. Θα το μοιραστώ 